between Bobby and the FBI up his ass all the time. He's going fucking crazy. Tell Jimmy I'm sorry for his troubles. The old timers know the old man. They'll talk to him at some point. They'll straighten it out for him. Yeah, but he can't understand. And I got to be honest with you. I don't understand either. How you just could help get those two fucking Kennedy pricks elected in the first place. It don't make no sense to him. That's for sure. He doesn't have to understand everything. You know what I'm talking about. Sometimes it's better. Uh, is it when I see him like that, I don't, you know, I, I, I'm trying to, I feel bad. I want, I want to help him in some way. And I, and I, and I, Listen, he's too emotional. Like some guy who's always rushing, rushing all over the place, and they miss the big picture. Like Cuba. Getting us back into casinos. Getting us back into Havana. Like getting rid of that fucking Castro prick. The old timer spoke to the old man. The old man talked to his son, Jack, and he told him, don't forget who the fuck he owes. He knows who the fuck he owes. That's, of course, Joe Pesci and Robert De Niro, a clip from The Irishman. I know it's a rather long clip, but it's an important clip, and it's history. I think a lot of people, I guess maybe younger people, don't realize it's, of course, a fictional account, but it's history. This is what happened. There was this guy who ran the Teamsters Union called Jimmy Hoffa, and the union back then was unbelievably powerful it ran the country it ran the trucks if they shut down the union you know no one got fed and all the rest of this stuff he had a lot of power and he was very tight with the mob and the mob was taking care of him and he was taking care of the mob and he was loaning all the money to build the casinos in las vegas and this was the dynamic and also back then the mafia organized crime was super powerful much more powerful than we can kind of even imagine today And what they're talking about in this scene in particular is how some people in the mafia felt betrayed by the fact that Joe Kennedy, who was JFK's father and who amassed all his wealth by smuggling alcohol from Canada to the U.S. and was tied in with all organized crime. And he's the one who had gone to the mob and said, hey, maybe you can help here with my son. They felt betrayed that now JFK and in particular Robert Kennedy, who was attorney general, was really going after the mob and was stamping out organized crime. All this at a time when the top cop, J. Edgar Hoover, because he was compromised, because he was a gay man and liked to dress up in women's clothes, and because some people in the mob had pictures of that, and because compromise, human compromise, is always in play, is always your number one go-to tool, a la Jeffrey Epstein. So that's why the top cop in the United States publicly stated that there was no mafia. Again, if you don't know this history, go back and read it because you're really going to have to understand it to understand where I'm going and understand why I keep hammering on the Romans and why we have today's most excellent guest, David Matheson, author of Myth and Trauma, Higher Self, Ancient Wisdom and Their Enemies, along with a number of other books, you might understand better why he says... I would say that the imposition of literalist Christianity was a deliberate... It just it just doesn't happen that Christianity just took over the Roman Empire the way we're kind of taught. But back to the clip, back to history, back to what really happened. Because, of course, what happens is JFK is assassinated... And clearly the mob is part of that, and clearly the CIA is part of that, and clearly LBJ is part of that. And if you haven't read any of the 200 or 300 books that are published on that, then you don't know that history. But so many people that we'd expect to know that history don't know that history or are faking that history. You know, one of my favorite podcasts for a long time has been Hardcore History with Dan Carlin. It's extremely popular, one of the most popular podcasts in the world. He believes Lee Harvey Oswald was a lone nut assassin. This is inconceivable to anyone who's investigated it, who any, to anyone who's really studied the history. You know, I recently had an interview on this guy's show, Jeffrey Doherty, on Indoctrinate Yourself. I had a great time on his show, and actually I was supposed to do an interview with him today, and he backed out. But it was a great interview. It was all about Christianity and false narratives and all that stuff. I found out the guy is somewhat of a Holocaust denier. 
And as offensive as that is morally to think that we would want to apologize for such an evil act, it again strikes me like Dan Carlin. How do you process that history in that way to come to that conclusion? Well, I would suggest that as I continue to plow through this Roman history, that if I do my job, you will find what we're talking about with first century Roman history is almost as clear cut as JFK and almost as clear cut as the absurdity of denying the Holocaust. And the hardest part of really processing all that is going to be wrapping your head around how so many people cannot see what really becomes obvious the further you look into it. Here are some extended clips from my upcoming interview with David Matheson. So here's Arch of Titus, 81 CE, built by his younger brother Domitian after... Do you think Domitian Titus killed him? Died. I don't know. Just so people know, Titus said, years, years. I only made one mistake. And that was, there was a plot and it was tied to his brother. And instead of killing his brother Domitian, he banished him. And then a year later, he gets assassinated. He said, I only made one mistake. It's compelling. There was a lot of assassinations going on. This is the famous cave four, where the vast majority of the Dead Sea Scrolls are found. The Dead Sea Scrolls mm -hmm. found in the 1940s, fragments of over 900 texts, manuscripts, and in thousands of pieces like jigsaw puzzles discovered in the 40s and then given into the hands of an international group of scholars who kept the Dead Sea Scrolls basically under wraps for their entire lives. They didn't let anyone see anything, but there's one scroll known as the... Copper. The Copper Scroll, and you see it on the right-hand side of your screen. It looks very different than the, the written scroll. The Copper Scroll, it was... <laughs> It was all rolled up on copper and was so old that they had to cut it in part. And so that's why these pieces now look kind of like, like a half of a tube. What is the copper scroll? It's basically the list of treasure. It, this is how it reads. This is the first words of the copper scroll, not the part that I'm showing, by the way. That's like piece number 18. But on piece one, it says, in the ruin that's in the Valley of Acor, under the steps with the entrance at the east. So you go to the ruins, find the entrance that's on the east, then under the steps, a distance of 40 cubits, a strong box of silver and its vessels with a weight of 17 talents, which by the way, a talent at that time, New Testament talent or that period talent, 129 pounds. So that's 129 pounds of silver times 17. That's a lot. Oh, by the way, at the end of the copper scroll, it says, this is a copy. This is a copy. You know, we put it on this. <laughs> they don't say it, but why would you put it on copper? So it can't burn. So look, this treasure is important. We don't want to lose it. We're going to put, we're going to put the treasure map or the treasure instructions. It's not really a map on something that can't be destroyed, copper. And um, this will be the backup copy. Well, who had the, who had the other copy? I bet you Josephus knew how to find it. And that's why Vespasian and Titus got all the loot and were managed to become emperors. And that's the evidence is, is pretty overwhelming that, <laughs> I mean, as you said, Josephus didn't get all those things because, you know, he said, I think you're going to become the emperor. Okay, thanks a lot. Cut off his head. He said, I know where the treasure is buried. Please don't cut off my head because you won't get any of it. Welcome to Skeptica, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. Today, we welcome back David Matheson to Skeptico. David is, well, he's really quite an amazing author, researcher, thinker. Um, and we're going to talk a lot about why I think David is so interesting and important, because I think that's kind of a big part of this story, actually, how somebody can do what he's done and reveal to us what has always been right there in front of us. When somebody does that, that is really pretty remarkable. And that's exactly what he's done. We're going to talk about, well, we may talk about a number of his great books that I've just pulled up here on Amazon. He's got many of them and they are really quite terrific, quite amazing. But we will probably spend more time on this one in particular, 
myth and trauma, higher self, ancient wisdom, and their enemies. So it's a book that was published just last year, so it hasn't been out that long. It's great, like a lot of David's books. It's really terrifically uh, illustrated. You know, a lot of stuff he talks about, he's talking about the stars and the constellations as we know them, and you need to see it. And then you need to see the art associated with it, the myths associated with it, and he's done that. Extensive notes in this book, extensive references in this book, like all his books. So this is uh, something that is valuable for someone who's interested in in something beyond the story, although the, the stories are all super great too. So that's all uh, what's coming up. David, Welcome back to Skeptico. It's great to have you here. Thanks so much, Alex. It's great to be here. I'm so, looking forward to it. You know, uh, b before we jump too far into the books, I, I hope you will take a minute and go over your background a little bit, because I think it's, it's quite unique and quite interesting. And I think in a way it turns out to be relevant to this story. So the, the brief bio thing. Yeah. Happy to. Sure. Well, um, I really grew up loving the stars and the constellations. My dad used to take me out where I lived in, uh, where I grew up in San Mateo, California, which is in the Bay Area. And we'd look at the stars and we used, even from really before I can remember, you know, I can't remember not having these books by H.A. Ray, who does the outlining system. H.A. Ray is famous. We've talked about it before on this show, is famous for along with his wife, Margaret Ray, creating the Curious George series of books starting in the 1940s. He also wrote a very important book called The Stars, A New Way to See Them, A New Way to See Them in 1952, which turns out to be a very ancient way to see them. Not a, you know, there's a mystery there, but I grew up seeing the constellations using that system. And I also grew up loving the myths. I ended up going to West Point in, uh, I graduated high school in 1987, 13 days later, I trotted off to the East Coast and got my head shaved and started getting yelled at at, at the military academy. And you, you um, know, can I interject something? Cause I had never really made that connection. You're in San Mateo and yeah. now you're going to upstate New York. Did you have any idea <laughs> what you were getting into there? That kind of culture change that you're thrown into or? Well, I had been uh, back to visit. So they, they do uh, have like visits for candidates, uh, kind of like a recruiting thing for football, but I wasn't a football player. Um, and I had also spent the summer before that, the summer uh, before my senior year at Harvard summer school. So that was, <laughs> that was, that was a real eye opener to see the kind of the East Coast, the Northeast for the first time. I mean, it is really much more densely populated than California is, even the Bay Area. Um, you know, there's a lot, there's obviously a lot of differences. When I first, you know, flew back there with my dad and we were in Watertown and the waitress said something about, well, do you want a quota? And she was talking about a quarter. I was like, I can't believe it. You know, people actually do talk like this. And I went to all the, I went to all the, uh, Harvard, uh, from Harvard, I would take the red line to the green line. And I went to all the Red Sox games in the bleachers that year for three bucks. That was the year 86, summer of 86. They went to the World Series against the Mets. So I did have uh, a little bit of an immersion in the East Coast that summer. Got to see Roger Clemens. I sat in the bleachers, you know, and Roger Clemens in the bullpen right there. We're getting off track, but it's a great question. It is, you know, I would say that as, at 17, I didn't appreciate the difference as much as I do today. Now I've got grown sons. I took one of my sons back for a basketball camp in the summer around Boston. And I was, then I, then I was really impressed by the difference. I was like, I didn't really perceive the difference as much as I do coming back. I don't know if that makes any sense. <laughs> and you know, one of the reasons I guess I think this is important to talk about is this is a very, very big idea kind of book, uh, larger than the book. It's your whole work is a big idea kind of stuff. It's kind of audacious to even think that someone could say there's these ancient, ancient esoteric myths 
in the stars and they've basically been forgotten, been written out of history, and they're highly relevant to our world today, and they've been relevant to every culture throughout time. I mean, who the hell are you to say that? It's just, it is, you know, just ballsy to say that. So one of the things I think we're gonna talk about today is, hey, why doesn't that come out through our history? Because as you lay out your case, it's remarkable, but it's really solid, and it is a lot of it's been there. So one of the questions is, why don't we have access to it? And so, you know, West Point, you have a military background. Um, I, I don't want to get conspiratorial on that because I don't think your story goes that way. But I think it changes your orientation. I think it changes your way of viewing things the way of kind of take that hill mentality in some way that allows somebody to do this kind of stuff. Because otherwise, you look at your work and go, bullshit, you know how many emails I get? <laughs> Not a lot, but emails, a theory of everything. I, hey, you know, I've studied this stuff on my own, <laughs> you know, in my basement. I got it all figured out. It's just not credible. But in a way for you to, you, you're transcending that but you're not coming from Harvard. You don't, you know, you don't, you're not professorship, all that stuff. So I think we have to fill that in. I think that's part of, I think that's part of your story. And I think it's also part of the story that we're in right now in terms of our culture. And I think people are more and more open to saying, maybe this guy did do it. Maybe this one guy on his own did kind of crack the code on this. Would you have any thoughts on any of that stuff? Wow. <laughs> well, Thanks for those kind words. And I would say it's not, first of all, it's not one guy on his own because there are people throughout history who have noticed connections between the myths and the stars. I would say that I got obsessed with it. I compare it to the movies where you, you've got the guy out in the shed with all the red string, you know, in his backyard uh, in the shed and his wife comes out and finally opens it up and says, what on earth is going on here? You know, the board with all the strings connecting. I, I kind of became that individual um but but um you know it's interesting you, you you use a metaphor of it's kind of a take the hill mentality but i would use actually a metaphor of almost an, an outsider uh in the sense that if you think of sherlock holmes um the pattern that conan doyle came up with in the sherlock holmes books or even edgar Allan poe who was famously kicked out of West Point, <laughs> um, who kind of invented the modern uh, mystery story. It's an outsider a lot of times, or an even better example is the Scooby-Doo uh, cartoons that I grew up watching. They come along and there's some mystery that's going on and the authorities have got it all figured out. And they are not particularly happy when Sherlock Holmes shows up or when scooby-doo and the gang show up because it is it's an outsider who's looking at it from a different perspective and i would say that you know certainly coming from california going to west point you get you know all those same kind of uh jokes that you see in an officer and a gentleman well you're from california all they get from there is fruits and nuts or you know other things that you can you can fill in the blanks um it's kind of an outsider and i did actually growing up um you know, I was thinking about it just generally, generationally. I'm in the Gen X generation. That's the first generation where both parents typically worked and they were called the latchkey kids. You know, I'm, I grew up, you know, displaced a lot. So uh, moving schools a lot, um, getting picked on a lot as a kind of a nerdy kid. Uh, maybe that influenced psychologically going to West Point, who knows? But it's almost like the outsider can see things that the authorities haven't seen. Um, there are people who have been on this trail of clues before me, but it's almost like once you start to see it, it's all there. You know, it's not that amazing that I've produced all these books because frankly, I can't fit the evidence. You know, this is just scratching the surface. It's really the metaphor I use, or another metaphor is like, if my in my backyard there was a big storm and it washed away a gully and there's millions of dinosaur bones on the side of the gully and I start bringing them to the museum and they say, how is one person producing all these dinosaur bones? Well, 
Alex, they're right there. They're <laughs> right there. It's in the myths. It's right there in front of you. The myths are based on the stars, all of them. The Bible stories are based on the stars from first to last. The myths of ancient India in the Vedas, which there's thousands and thousands of gods and goddesses and stories. It would take lifetimes to go through them all. And yet they're based on the stars. And it can be shown to be the Greek myths, the Norse myths, the myths of the Maya, all the way around the world, Africa, ancient Egypt, Mesopotamia. They're, they're, it's beyond doubt, in my opinion, the, the evidence is overwhelming that they're based on the stars. Well, I like the way you kind of caught yourself there because it's not even based on your opinion. It's just based on the evidence and you just lay it out just one after another. And I, I almost, <clears throat> I'm not going to apologize for doing this because that was the whole intent of doing it, but I'm kind of going to pull you away a little bit from that <laughs> awesome body of research. But I really want to encourage people to go uh, check it out. We did a previous interview where we just kind of, again, just kind of tapped into it. But, um, you know, these books and this latest one, and I don't even know if it is the latest one, but Myth and Trauma, which we will be referencing. Uh, great, great, great stuff in that one, too, and a lot of new and surprising stuff. But the reason I kind of say that is, I, you know, I emailed you because kind of strange coincidence, it isn't a coincidence. I've been really stuck on this idea about Rome. And I'm kind of at this hidden in plain sight moment that intersects in a way with a tiny bit of what you've looked into too, which is super interesting. And we're going to, I really want to, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of pulling you into that as one, as an authority to fill in my missing pieces on this. But for me, the, the psyop in plain sight is that Christianity is started as a psyop whether it turns into what it turns into, all the rest of that I, is kind of up for grabs. But I think when you just lay it out, the evidence seems pretty clear that its origins are, hey, let's try this. We've, this is a tried and true, tried and true formula for us is screwing with religion as a way to, you know, boost our power to supercharge our military might, uh, it's a social engineering project. and. So this then intersected with some of the writings that you've done on your your website, which is equally you know super strong. And the reading the blog posts are there, and you can search through them. But I won't reference any of those right now. But you've written about this, and you've written about this time period, and you've written about Josephus. And people get tired of hearing me talk about Josephus, but he's important to this. So I want to pull you into all that, but. I, I, before we even get there, I, I, I wanted to touch on a couple other things because one of the three, there's three ways that I think we're kind of kindred spirits on this thing. One is that I get the hidden in plain sight thing. I get that that can happen. I believe that, one, I believe what you've found because the evidence is compelling, but I also believe that it's possible. I believe that David Matheson can really have kind of cracked the code on something that so many other people didn't see. And if you don't believe that's possible, then you can't really get into your work fully, you know, because you're always going to be like, you know, check yourself like, no, this can't be true. And then the, the second point is that, that I, I think we're kindred spirits on is in my investigation so far, I've come across just how miserably incompetent what we call uh, history or academia in a lot of cases. It's just ridiculous. It's just insane. And you have to kind of pull up yourself and say, well, can it really be that bad? And um, I was just going to tell you a really quick anecdote because I just interviewed this guy named uh, Dave Brody. He's written this really cool book called Romerica about how the Ninth Roman Legion might have wound up in America in the second century. So good story he does, and he has all this great evidence in it, archeological evidence and, and all the rest of this stuff, carbon dating, part of the evidence are coins, coins that seem to wash up. Every 10 years, there's a major storm and there's a second century coins that are washing up on the East Coast of where he lives. And here's the, the point of this is that he 
said that, you know, this clearly points to the natural conclusion. We Ah, there is a sunken ship out there that has coins in it that's washing up. But it doesn't fit the, the narrative that we have because second century, there couldn't have been any Roman, you know, ships out there. So what does academia do with that? They just come up with the most bizarre explanations. And he's kind of saying, look, look, look what I'm up against. I have historians that say, well, maybe a coin collector went to the beach and lost his coins. And we're both kind of laughing, you know, and I and after I was like, you know, I, I can't even believe that. I mean, Dave's a good guy and stuff, but he, he he's making that up. That can't be real. So I said, <laughs> Dave, send me the send me the reference to that. And uh, and he did. And there it is. You know, this guy from Michigan State University published in the Peer Review Journal, The Coin Collector. I've talked to Coin Hunt. And I'm just like, it, it's, it's unbelievable how miserably incompetent some, not all, but some of these people are. And I think that, you know, typically people like you and your theories have had to push against this perceived, you know, ivory tower that knows so much. And when we push into that a little bit and we find out that it's just really, really poorly done, I think that is kind of a, a big thing. Do, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, this is a great subject, Alex. It's a great subject. And I, you know, I applaud your show and its approach because you're, you're tackling this this is kind of one of the themes of your show is tackling this, you know, just defer to the experts. I saw, you know, if, and we've all now experienced a year of just absolute, you know, trying to figure out what, you know, we won't even go into it, but if you're not- Right, a lot of deferring. <laughs> if you're not entertaining at least some possibility that there are narratives, <laughs> we could call them conspiracies, agendas, other than what necessarily you're being told at this point, you're just not paying attention because some of the things make absolutely no sense that are going on, but we'll just set that aside. We can all refer to our own experience and our own position on that. But I saw a cartoon where there's a man and a woman standing in a rain shower and he's holding an umbrella to cover them both. And, and he says, looks like it's, you know, it's pouring. And she goes, who do you think you are? A meteorologist? You know, <laughs> That's great, great. you can't say that. You can't say that you, until you've got a degree nobody believes you or until <laughs> so um but you're when you're saying just the level of ignorance and incompetency i would say alex thank you for being so generous and imputing to them that it's mere incompetence rather than deliberate obfuscation which i can point to in today's conversation i mean i think you can tell you can tell me in the audience where you sent me an email kind of where you want to go. Um, I think I can get to some examples of it's almost impossible to believe just plain ignorance going on for over a hundred years in certain subjects. Not you know, not even the subject of all the myths being based on the stars, which the evidence is overwhelming and yet so far i haven't been you know academia is not bust, busting down my door to say hey i'd like you to come lecture my uh, comparative religion department about this this seems interesting um you know I, uh, I i've i've experienced kind of like polite encouragement like you know very good you know thanks and um you know run along kind of kind of uh, when I've reached out most of the time. But anyway, so that's fine. I'll publish it. You know, I think it's important to share with people who are looking for it and and uh, make it available to people who are looking for it. And you can decide for yourself. And I'll show some evidence for people who are saying, what is he talking about myths based on stars? Because I want to show what has been lost before we get into the story of how did it get lost? And Rome is right at the center of that story. So that's I think that's where you want to go. And uh, you want to just... Well no, I, I want to, but ahead. I want to pick up on a couple of things you said because I, I think they're sure. important. And if we get off the trail, this will just be kind of the first cut of it, and then we'll come back and talk about Absolutely. the substance. Because, yeah. again, I can't stress enough: you are in a unique position in terms of what you've done here. It, like you immediately go to where I would go, which is, you know, my thing was with science, and, and I genuinely didn't know that it was 
conspiratorial. You know, you are a biological robot in a meaningless universe. I was like, gosh, darn, those guys are so dumb. They don't know it. And then, you know, I did it for five years. And I'm like, wait a minute. They knew it all along. They're just pushing. They're advancing a certain agenda for certain reasons. Okay, now it seems obvious to me. But I can tell you, I was doing a lot of interviews and it didn't seem obvious. And I was interviewing skeptics and I thought, well, they just really don't know, darn it, I got to convince them. So that's number one, is that I think there's a lot of different shades of kind of not knowing on both sides. One, one like the consumers of the information, you know, the guy on my side, on the outside, does it know but i think the guys on the inside don't know too the guys in the ivory tower you know there's the useful idiot thing and then there's the player thing and then there's a lot of things in between so the useful idiot is just someone who doesn't know it he's just seems to be he's advancing the narrative that they want so that he doesn't realize it but they're just laying down a little cheese in his maze and he's just following it and he's doing their bidding without knowing it and then there's the player the guy who we find out is totally tiled in and is cia or nsa or one of your guys uh, you know navy intelligence military intelligence but then there's a lot of things in between that too so I'm that's not one thing. I'm not, I'm not connected to military intelligence in any way. <laughs> okay, no, no, no. All right, continue. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I'm just uh, saying. I was a low level. I got to the rank of captain, and I was in the infantry. And I was a, uh, I was an infantry officer. That's what I did. Okay. I wasn't dialed into any. I wasn't privy to any secrets. <laughs> there's okay, a, good. There's a layer system. Yeah. Hey, and, and you know what? Even that, I have to say, because I made a major misstep in saying that. Because a lot of people will go there because I get this all the time. People are like, uh, wait, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and it's not necessarily so, you know, but I, I'm, I'm going to digress too far. One thing I want to interject is you are qualified. You know, like before, you you didn't just, you, not only West Point, you got a master's degree, you went back and did, you did teaching at where, the War College or at West Point? I no, mean, you I, I lectured. taught at West Point. Yeah, I taught in the Department of English and philosophy at West Point. In fact, I had the wonderful opportunity to teach the Odyssey. I always mention that because it was such a highlight because I've loved the Odyssey. Like the Odyssey could be your Bible. If you want to use the Odyssey as a Bible, that is, it is as profound as any other literature on the planet. And I got to use the translation by the late, great Robert Fagels. He was a professor at Princeton and he came and spent time with us while we were teaching, you know, his translation of the Odyssey. So I'm always partial to his translation. It's a fantastic translation, but he was a wonderful scholar, a wonderful, just a gentleman, uh, just a wonderful person. So that just was a great a, experience. Yeah. Just as an aside, were you turned on to the star myth at that time? Were you no, making those? No, no. So that's the thing, Alex. I loved the stars. I loved the myths. It, I was a very, you know, conservative, literalist Christian at the time. I was not looking for this. That's the other thing. You know, people can say, oh, maybe Dave's a, you know, an insider. I was not even looking for this. So if, I, so if I'm giving away uh, information, it wasn't, if it was given to me, it was given to me by some kind of brainwave weapon that I don't, you know, didn't even know what was happening. <laughs> I was not looking for the Bible to be all based on the stars. In fact, I was very resistant to that idea. I was reading the Bible on Sunday exclusively. I was not reading secular literature on Sundays. That's how serious I was about, you know, that was the, you know, the commandment of the Sabbath. You don't, I, even when I was going to grad school, I didn't read any of my study materials on Sunday. I just went to church and read the Bible. And so later, when I started to see the connections between the myths and the stars and seeing that the Bible was also based on the same system, uh, you know, I had a choice to make. <laughs> the evidence kept piling up. I had to either change really radically my, my point of view, which changed a lot of other things about my beliefs on politics and economics and other things. Um, but it changed my whole life, really. So I was not looking for it. I don't know if that... Did I no, it, it, see, and that, no, no, that's it. And because, you know, that that relates directly to this kind of third point where I think we kind of, for people to understand what we're going to talk about, they have to understand these three intersections in our kind of approach, because I see you as this understanding spirituality at a deeper level, not in terms of your personal spirituality, because I don't know what your personal spirituality is. 
but I understand that you understand that it's in play here. Because so many times when I talk to, I think it's a major failing of history. And when I talk to historians, kind of mainstream historians, how they've pulled out this undeniable fact that each one of these people we're talking about are leading rich spiritual lives. And that doesn't, that doesn't mean that it's a good rich spiritual life. I mean, whether it's angels or demons or satanic or, you know, Mithra or whatever it is, they are having the same kind of rich spiritual, you know, who am I? Why am I here? What happens after I die? What is the way to my soul? Is there a moral? And, and to take that out of the equation to me, you, you can't write it. You can't understand it. You can't begin to. And, and I think that is so, uh, so much a part of, uh, of really your work in a way that you don't always put forward, but it's certainly right there. I mean, right under the surface is that those people that were staring up at the stars, there was a connection on a, on a very deep spiritual level that they were trying to understand. And then you're saying that there was another, that they're really connecting to something else, but that's almost secondary to the fact that there is that spirituality in people that so many times history leaves out. Yeah, this is an important point. And so, you know, you said something earlier about Christianity being a psyop or, you know, the convince, being convinced that Christianity is a psyop. And I would... The, the origin... I mean, let, me, let me make sure, because I don't yeah. want to go off on the right thing. The, yeah. the, the initial origins of it, the start of it, I think it turned into something completely different than what they could have imagined. But I think we can trace back to... It was just a something, an operation that went really, really so much better than they ever could have imagined. But anyways, go ahead. Maybe you don't yeah, agree. Yeah, no, I, I, I would say that the imposition of literalist Christianity was a deliberate, it just, it just doesn't happen that Christianity just took over the Roman Empire the way we're kind of taught that it did. Oh, you know, just um, we can get into that. But Christianity itself, or the scriptures, the ancient stories that are in the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament, I believe are very ancient, very profound, very positive, very beneficial, and speaking and and speak to people. And that's part of the reason why, you know, I like I said, I was, I found a lot of truth and meaning in the Bible while I was taking it literally. However, I believe that taking it literally inverts. I think what happened was ancient. This ancient system is related to all the other myths. The the stories in the Bible are related to the myths of Osiris or the Gilgamesh and Inanna and the stories that you find in the Americas. They're very profound. They have a very positive potential use. But like a martial art, as I kind of say in the in the book, a martial art can be used for very positive things. It can also be used for negative things. And what this imposition of this literalist um, structure that then became basically an imperialist structure that went out and started stamping out other stamp. At first, they stamped out all the Roman and Greek gods and the Egyptian gods. And then they started stamping out what was in Western Europe. And then Northern Europe came later, like, Scandinavia, the Norse myths, and then it jumped across and started stamping out whatever it could find in the Americas. It is a world dominating uh, system, which the, the good teachings of those ancient stories are still there. But when you start to understand that they're not literal, I believe you can, it is, it is profoundly positive and you get rid of the negative parts that come along with the literalist. The, most of the negative aspects of it come from the literalist imposition, which is a mistake or a, a, a twisting, an inversion of the stories in the, in the first place. Maybe I'm getting a little ahead because I haven't even shown anything, but that's, I wanted to kind of make that clear. I'm not trying to bash anybody's deep beliefs. And if you have deep beliefs in something, uh, if you know, Jesus or whatever else, I'm not trying to take away from what, what, what works for anybody, but this is, this has been very profound for me. And I, th and I think it's uh, definitely worth sharing and, and, and seeing, oh my goodness, an, an entire new depth of, 
multiple depths of meaning come out when you start to actually listen to them in the language that they're speaking, which is an esoteric metaphorical language that is a celestial, based on a celestial metaphor. See, and I'm, I'm okay with that, but I'm not interested in it. Okay, and, 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 no, it, it, But understand why I'm not interested in it, because I don't want us to get kind of at cross purposes. Sure. I'm not interested in it because I just want to drive towards a couple of data points and then let people run wherever they want with them. And it is, as you said first, my first inclination is kind of deconstruction and destruction in a lot of ways. So I'm not interested in preserving somebody's uh, belief system or interjecting my belief system. I'm just interested in laying out the facts. And again, yeah. go to David's books and learn all about the myths and the connection. I'm saying he is under, he understands the spiritual connection, but here's where I'm trying to go. I'm talking too much. I want to start chapter 13, the cult of Mithras in this book, myth of trauma, because to me, I want to pull you into focus on this point because I think it's a pivotal, pivotal point in history. And it's not obscure history. Like, like the thing that people should get excited about your work is it's ancient, but it's immediate. <laughs> it's right now, it's happening. And I say the same thing about this. You know, you want to talk about uh, Mithras, you immediately go to Julius Caesar, who's interesting, and Brutus, and Mark Anthony, and Cleopatra. It's all right there. And then you go to, you know, uh, Jesus. It's uh, that time period and all right there. So you should be interested in it in all those reasons. But the real reason you should be interested in it is you're living it right now. You are living the result of that cult and what they did and how they socially engineered our spiritual yearning into something that they want. So I'll just start with the, the history and pulling you to chapter 13. What is the cult of Mithras? Yeah, no, you're and you're absolutely right, Alex. It is it is this is the biggest conspiracy in history and it's still going on and it impacts, you know, what, wherever you are on the political spectrum, that political spectrum is a playing out of this same great point. This yes. same thing that's been going on forever and uh I, I i will show you i've got slides in here for mithras so the cult of mithras is often portrayed as a rival to christianity there are all these different mystery religions floating around in the roman empire at that time and people were experimenting with all these different things and oh mithra ism started getting traction especially among the army it, it was definitely among the army the praetorian guard if you've seen the movie gladiator actually that movie for whatever reason happens to focus in on almost the crucial juncture in this whole conspiracy the handoff between marcus aurelius who most people have heard of and his son commodus who was played by joaquin phoenix in that movie and um We'll get into that, but so the cult of Mithras or the the society of Mithras or Mithraism is often portrayed as, well, it was gaining a lot of traction at the same time that Christianity was gaining a lot of traction and both, and, and history was in the balance and it could have tipped one way or the other, but uh, Christianity won out. Why? Well, probably because Mithraism only allowed men into the lodges. It was a little more exclusive and Christianity was a little more inclusive and Christianity, you know, Jesus famously hung out with prostitutes and, you know, everybody was welcome. Whereas Mithraism was a little bit more, uh, you know, the army or the Praetorian guard or certain people who were in the kind of the equites, the, the equator, uh, equ uh, Equestrian class. Equestrian class. And therefore, but, yeah. hey, and hey, therefore, let, let me, and therefore let me Christianity won out. That's totally false. That's no, no, totally no. False yeah, oh, that's that's the whole. But no, no, and that's all great. So, but uh, let's break down for people because uh, this term cult is really interesting because it kind of has a different meaning for us than it did for them back then. And, and, and so let's talk about what cult meant. And then it's really interesting, you know, I would interject a, a little bit, is that the whole <laughs> cult thing starts with Julius Caesar, who is kind of this 
pretty big ego guy, and he says, you know, the, the Senate and kind of democracy thing isn't big enough. How do I get even bigger? I'll make myself a god. You know, well, I need a god. I need a way to worship. And that becomes the origin of the cult. And then that works, so it's rebooted over and over again. But uh, it, add to that, but, you know, I mean, a cult is what we would understand to be the Catholic Church would be exactly equivalent. The, 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 a Roman would see absolutely no difference between what we're what they're calling a cult and uh, Roman Roman Catholic, right? Well, you know the, the term cult in our in our society has been heavily impacted by what happened during the '60s, where you had what were basically intelligence operations um, creating cults like Manson. That was a that was a complete operation. Um, Jim Jones. If you if you dig into the Jonestown, you will uncover the threads that pull apart. You know the entire wool that's been pulled over your eyes as. Uh, you know, as as uh, Morpheus famously says in the uh, in the Matrix, if you pull on Jonestown, the whole wool, the world that's been pulled over your eyes comes apart. Um, and John Judge wrote a, a, a like a longer than essay about Jonestown that really shows you that that was an operation. So these cults, like if you watch the movie Bad Times at the El Royale, where there's a cult in there, uh, it's it is that that was like the 60s um, reenactment or <laughs> use weaponization of of certain things that that the that this group has been has known how to do for a long time. Um, now I'm saying too much. Scratch that from the record there, Alex. No, no, no. no. So it's, cult, it's it's so, interesting. Yeah. So cult, you know, we have this idea that of cult that's been basically impressed on us because of the Moonies and the, uh, you know, Jonestown, all of which have intelligence connections. And this whole thing that I'm talking about is intelligence agencies are basically the modern, a modern arm of this um, cult of Mithras or operation of Mithras. But the word cult just comes from the word culture. It means something that grows. If I cultivate the land, you know, I can make barley grow or I can make flowers grow. I can grow and, and we, human beings everything we do is culture whether it's um you know you can read <laughs> you know like i said I, I i got a master's in english and read a lot of foucault and you know the the derrida and the these uh scholars in the 60s who started to say let me examine the phenomena of friday night fights and what that that's a cultural manifestation of the 50s or the types of cars people drive that is culture and so once we start to identify ourselves with certain well i dress this way i'm sending you signals and and you basically create a culture which uh and now a cult has kind of religious or spiritual aspects to it and there was a lot of that floating around in the in the period in the roman period you know we found the dead sea scrolls and they're a big part of this story and i think you want to get to those and i've got some things to say about the dead sea scrolls because they uh, have they have tremendous evidence that points to something went on that eliminated the ancient wisdom. I think really what I want to do is show what kind of a, a, a couple of slides that maybe give some people who are right now maybe spinning going, what the heck is David and Alex talking about, um, just to put a little bit of a framework on it, to show what was lost. What we had was ancient wisdom that was given to every culture around the world. And then it got stamped out. And around the time that it got stamped out, there were cults circulating around. You have the Essenes, which a lot of people associate them with the Dead Sea Scrolls, where they had a very strict, you don't get into that community except through like two years of probation. Well, yeah, we'll let you in, but every six months, we're going to talk about your behavior and see what, nope, he didn't button his bottom button on his tunic. That guy is too radical, kick him out. And they weren't necessarily, the Essenes were a cult, but they weren't necessarily gathering people in. People were coming to the Essenes. They weren't running around trying to impose their views on others. At least most scholars say they weren't. Then you had kind of, apocalyptic cults who were actually actively going out and seeking members and saying, listen, the world is 
fixing to end in a couple of years. It is time now to quickly sell all your possessions and start doing the right thing or you're going to be burned up where, uh, instead of going to the good place. And that was going on and they were aggressively going out and, you know, gathering or spreading their message. And you listen to, you know, scholars talking about John the Baptist will say, look at John the Baptist. He is saying the ax is at the root of the tree. It's about to come down, repent, get in the water right now and change your life or else because the tree is about to get chopped down. Now, um, that was going on at this time. So that's more of what we think about as a cult. You know, a cult goes on TV and has ads and says, you should come and do, do this and get, and get right before something bad happens. The UFO comes and takes us. You know, I, I was out in the desert when that, that whole uh, hail bop comet, I was out in the National Training Center under the stars and I looked up and I said, that's a comet. I didn't even know there was a comet coming. This was in, you know, the 96, the hail bot, bot comet. And there was the Heaven's Gate cult. You remember that? And they all, you know, committed suicide because they thought the, the UFO was coming. So anyway. Um, well, well, hold on, because, you know, there's a couple different ways to go there. And I don't want to slow that down. And I want you to go ahead and do those slides. Um, but there's something right beneath the surface there that we have to kind of bring out is that for whatever reason we all have programmed into us this positive thing about cults and this negative thing about cults in terms of our participation in them we need community we like community we like fellowship and we like structure we like rules and that isn't a bad thing but sometimes that gets out of control so you know you're talking about the dead sea scrolls and some of the evangelical groups that are described there. I mean, it's wacky. It's, it's, it's just like you're saying, they are different versions of the same thing that we see today. And we see that people, when they get together, have a tendency to do that. I, I think what your book also, or your whole work also relates to though, which is the, the difficult thing to balance. And I don't know if we're gonna be able to balance it in this conversation, is there's a genuine spiritual yearning in these people. So a, a lot of times when we look at that from an atheistic perspective, we go, oh, those fucking moonies, what idiots, you know, or those Jim Jones people, how could you be so stupid? How could you inject that Kool-Aid into your daughter's mouth? Well, I would suggest again, that those people are having rich spiritual lives. Now, maybe it's, they're talking to, they're being influenced by malevolence. I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know what their spiritual life is, but, I, I think we make a mistake if we think that they're not trying to figure the shit out in the same way that we are. And you're not saying otherwise. I'm just saying when we start pulling that apart, there's those two aspects of it. And then there's this third aspect of it, which I'm going to turn this into a question because I don't know. But my little riff on the imperial cult that was really started by uh, Aurelius after Caesar, because, you know, Aurelius is the great grand, it's his great grand uncle or whatever Caesar, uh, Julius Caesar is, but he wants to wrap himself around that. So he says, no, I'm going to create the imperial cult is about Caesar. Don't you guys want to worship Caesar? He was like a god. And then he goes, and who am I? Well, I'm the adopted son of the god. Isn't that pretty good? And he starts building these temples, uh, th these cults, these temples all throughout the empire to Again, I think it relates to what you're saying, to kind of mirror, compete, uh, offer a counterbalance to the other temples and things that are going on, because he sees that that's kind of an important thing. And that imperial cult thing that starts with the kind of, that then gets rebooted and it's gonna get rebooted later and later and later because it becomes this play that we can kind of turn in and 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 then so we're going to tie that into the the cult of mithras maybe the cult of mithras is going on all through this or not but what would what do you think about any of that do you have any thoughts or yeah no researches? okay so so the first so the first part um so i think you're thinking of augustus you you, you slipped and augustus, said augustus augustus really you're right i'm sorry times. Augustus. You're, you're, right. that's okay though but actually so the um you know the association of kings with gods 
in ancient Egypt, ancient Mesopotamia is not really that uncommon. It is uncommon in Greece, right? Greeks would have none of that crap. They'd be like, no, 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 right? So, but there's a reason, I, I would say, you know, I, uh, this is a bit of a tangent, but it's not really because it's, uh, it's almost like a political question of the gifts of the gods to a nation include the rivers, include the fertile soil. All those things were seen as coming from the gods and the gifts of the people, the children that are born are born there by the, by the uh, will of the gods. And you, Alex, have certain gifts and makeup that is just yours. You have certain personality traits and interests and like, you will take the conversation in a different way than any other podcaster that I talk to because you're Alex, right? You've been given that those gifts by the gods uh, that this was the ancient perspective. And so who protects those or who, the king is responsible for making sure that those gifts are benefiting the whole land and are not taken over by oligarchs who just use them for themselves. And so the, the tyrant was actually the guy who came in and smashed up the oligarchs when they got to uh, grabbing and, 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 taking all of the gifts of the gods away from the rest of the people and just benefiting themselves. So the king was there as like a representative of the gods to prevent, to ensure, ideally, I'm saying ideally, the, the ancients were fine with democracy and they were fine with monarchy. They weren't too keen on oligarchy, which is basically what we have today. But anyway, um, the, the coins would have pictures of the gods on them because the whole economy comes from the gifts of the gods. And sometimes they would also have the king on there because he or the queen is supposed to be like the intermediary for the ruling on behalf of the gods for, for the benefit of the people. Long tangent, but so I would say that what's, you know, Julius Caesar is not my expertise. And I think that the whole imposition of the Mithras movement came after in the time of Vespasian, which, you know, you've talked to Joe Atwell a few times and we can get into that whole thing. The whole, the Vespasian, uh, um, Titus and Domitian, the Flavian dynasty or dynasty is a crucial turning point. It's, it's after the Caesars. It's after Nero. It's right after Abs Nero. Absolutely. Absolutely. So and I want you to to go on that and and to 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 move there. Um, I just wanted to. I, I was hoping that I was building on what you were saying, and I'd I'd kind of. I don't think that last part of what you said is a tangent at all. It's something that it's going to be impossible to wrestle to the ground, but I think it's fundamental to your work, and I think it's fundamental to. Basically, what I'm saying, too, is that I don't know what these extended realms are, but you just gave one possible narrative for how we interact with these extended realms, right? Which is there is some moral imperative, I always say. There is some moral good. There is some moral direction there. It is accessible. It was designed to be accessible to the people through the people who rule them. That sometimes goes awry and it gets, you know, awesome, awesome. And, and I, I mean that, you know, so then I think that's a good, a good thing to have on the table, Dave, because we got to kind of establish where we're coming from. And again, we, we might not get all the way through yeah, to, fine, you know, yeah. where we want to get today, but we, we have to do this. Otherwise, it, it doesn't really make any sense. So the that's only right. reason I want to talk about Josephus, I want to talk about the Flavians. I think that's where the action is. I want to talk about Josephus. That's where, but that's the part that's really gotten me excited. But when right. I, my kind of quick read through it, found that really this, this whole idea that we can kind of reboot this idea of the cult we can reboot which pops up directly into what you're going to say with you know it's not that far from vespasian and i think when vespasian does it and then really you know the when we're going to talk about the flavians we got vespasian and we have titus who only serves a very short time and then we have domitian and uh, a lot of people, I don't know what you think, but you read that history, it looks like the mission killed Titus. I mean, that, a lot of people suspect that, and that could be true. 
And it's kind of interesting because then he, of course, really reboots the the cult and really advances that thing, which is like, oh, the glorification of my brother and my father, which again would be typical, you know, play in the playbook of how to kind of another play in the evil playbook. But I'm just jump in there. I mean, we don't have to yeah, no, tell, is, take us is, to the slides that you have. Maybe yeah, or, this is interesting because I, I I think it's really interesting the the direction it's kind of that's what's grown up out of the cultivation of our conversation so far. That because I think that the smashing of that ancient understanding was in order to grab the resources among certain families, which is exactly what happened after the after the. Roman Empire was dissolved. Europe, especially Western Europe, because the Roman Empire cracked into Eastern and Western, the Western Roman Empire cracked into feudal fiefdoms, which then feudalism came in. That is the part of the world that basically then went out and colonized everybody later on. They became the colonial powers that started taking the resources from Africa, America, Asia, India, everywhere else. So this whole story that so and actually, yeah, I mean, the, I think they were just they were dismantling the Roman Empire, they were not exalting the Caesars, they were basically trying to get the Caesars out of the way and all the mechanisms of basically communal, the communal mechanisms that could stand against the oligarchs had to go. And that's, that's what I would I would argue this is more about oligarchs overthrowing anything that chains them down that's why i'm not a libertarian well and, and again it's it's hard to unpack all this because one of the things i think i see differently i'm really hung up on this idea of this uh spiritual life that people are living and i think mm -hmm. like even in this roman empire i see people that try and put it back try and put it back on course and the power of the cult, the power of the uh, evil, which is kind of, and the attraction of that um, kind of wins out sometimes. It doesn't win, and then in other places, in other parts of the world, it, it doesn't. So I think it's kind of a, 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 I always see it as kind of a mixed bag as history progresses. And then also, you know, I think when you jump to the end game, what you're doing, which is totally true, like, uh, like what you're saying, the way I interpret it is that these guys at some point realized that, wait a minute, this Christianity thing is the best fucking game in town. We can, you, you have a great quote in the thing. It's like, you know, it's the better way to rule. It's, it's to, if I have two uh, different groups that hate each other, but they're both Christian and I'm the Pope. I, I, this is the best possible situation. They're struggling, and they're at odds with you, they're fighting each other, and I'm above, I'm always above, I'm always above. It's the best possible thing. But the, where we kind of maybe see it slightly differently is I don't think they had, uh, I don't think they had such a great plan. I think okay. the plan was Sorry. kind of like, you know, like a lot of things that we see in real life, it's like, oh shit, I, that, that was a mistake. Wait a minute, maybe it wasn't such a mistake. Maybe we can go the next, maybe we can get this done, you know? It, and so uh, that's always in the back of my mind is that, you know, bring it back to, to yeah, we'll have this conversation like this is going to throw, <laughs> people are going to be like, whoa, whoop, chat. But like when you were talking about Corona, uh, I don't think these guys had any clue that they would be as successful with this social engineering project as it was. I don't think in their wildest dreams, they thought they would get everybody to just turn upside down, give away all their rights, that it would just be kind of, they just, you know, everyone just turn over and say, okay, I'll do whatever you say. Not in their wildest dreams. And the way I was, to, the way I relate it back to is, I look at like a climate change. They tried that fucking global warming shit for 20 years. And it didn't, it didn't work. If they were geniuses, they would have made that work. And you can see they're trying to bring it back now. But the thing is, they don't always have the answer. It's just, they got a lot of guns. They have a lot of uh, bullets 
<laughs> you know, it, it, and they can keep firing and keep firing. So th th I think that's at play here, and you might not see it that way, but I, I don't think they could have possibly seen how successful this game would be until it started to unfold. Yeah, I, I um, you know, <laughs> I'm not unwilling to go down those roads, but I do want to actually go back to because you've dropped this idea a couple of times and I haven't picked it up because I, um, about people searching for, they're searching. They join a cult because they're searching. The, the whole central thesis of myth and trauma, the book Myth and Trauma, is that these ancient myths are actually, they're multi, multi-layered, but they have as a central theme, the repair of trauma, the repair of that alienation that 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 hunger that we have inside our, ourselves what are we looking for we're searching for something the myths are talking about that and it's very very powerful and it's very very beneficial and and what we're looking for is ourself you're looking for yourself you've been alienated from yourself that's why there's so many myths about twins and there's so i can show you beyond doubt that the myths are talking about that and how to repair that. And we're looking for that desperately. And um, that's the only way to actually live up to our full potential, I would argue, is to recover that connection and get back in touch with who we are. That Because otherwise we're sabotaging ourselves all the time. And I think probably every listener, certainly myself, I have plenty of experience uh, with self-sabotage. Like I, I think we all know what that feel is and feels like. And so getting back in touch with yourself, think how much, you know, if you could live up to your full potential, think how great that would be. Well, if, if the myths are about that and you're trying to impose tyranny, oppression, and, uh, you know, taking away resources or imposing poverty, you don't want, you don't want that. And that's why Why would someone do that? Why would this. someone go down that path? Why would someone do those things to other people? Yeah, it's it's pretty it's pretty. Uh, no, no, I, I'm, I'm asking it as a real question. Yeah, to in order to take over and be and, and be look, if I'm the only one who knows Kung Fu in the village, I can run that village. Now, I well, could why do you be, want to run? The, why do you even want to run but, that? Why do you want to run that? This is we're going to go right back. Because they're not connected thing. to their self. That's why. Because if they were, they'd be like the Kung Fu master who comes in and says, I'm here to help. I'm here to help. Uh, I, look, I'm here to help prevent bullying. You know, the, the, if you look, think of like the Kung Fu movie, it's usually the Kung Fu master wanders in and he's there and he's he's protecting the woman from being abused and he's stopping the, the robbery that's going on. And, and it usually turns out that the central villain is also a Kung Fu master and he's using his Kung Fu to oppress the village and then they have a big fight. And that's kind of the, that's, that's the plot, how to write a great Kung Fu movie. So why is that, why, what's wrong with that bad Kung Fu master that he wants to take over the village and, and steal from everybody? There's something wrong inside that needs to get reconnected with that person. And I and I I think every single human being on this planet is a potential ally. I don't want to, I don't, you know, I think every single person, even the ones who are doing very bad things, can see the error of their ways and 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 turn towards uh <laughs> spreading the truth. I don't know if this is answering your question. No, why, you are directly answering my question. And I agree. Yeah. So I agree that everyone has the potential to turn towards the light. But I also think, and like, I, I just wrote this book, Why Evil Matters. And we're now talking about this book. And the point of the book is that it, it, we have to ask ourselves why, how this evil thing works. And it, it, it has to be more than just uh, our answer of just, I'm all about uh, look to the light. The secret of the ascent is to always look up. I'm always about that. But there's another level of that that we have to understand. I interviewed this guy, his prominent book is a clinical psychologist from Grand Rapids, Michigan, right? So he's just working with patients. I'm afraid of spiders, help me, I'm afraid of the water, da, da, da. Mm -hmm. Starts interviewing people and they have satanic ritual abuse 
in their background from when they're a kid. Mm -hmm. You know, you're four years old, you're getting satanically ritual abuse because your parents put you into that. Uh, it's, uh, Hell of, a, hell of a way to come up. But there's an evil there that we need to understand beyond, you know, we need to understand. The, and, and the, you know, the, I always tell the story, people get tired of it. The guy who wrote that book uh, and the guy who's the clinical psychologist, Tom Zinzer, he reached out to me and he said, Alex, you don't understand evil. You don't understand evil and darkness. And darkness is just there. It's like gravity. And evil is our need to explore darkness at different times. And so if the myths that you're talking about are engaged in that, like you're saying they are, then that's useful. But I think it's also useful to understand on a practical level that people are having extended consciousness experiences with malevolent entities that want them to do bad things <laughs> and they are being influenced in different ways and they're being influenced we're all being influenced on this plane and on other planes so i don't need you to you know believe that or endorse that but i uh, i equally don't need to believe or endorse you know a, a different belief about how you know people are processing that and every we have no everyone can be an ally it's like eh, i kind of think that some people in their current where they're at are just from a practical standpoint are not going to be allies and as a matter of fact i think if we see them as allies i think that's a kind of a a weakness that we have in our culture that you know, we have to see, oh, everyone, you know, there really is no uh, God, there really is no extended consciousness. So potentially, you know, it's just all our social concept. No, there's people out there. It's not like we're talking about the COVID. I mean, there's an agenda there and the people who are running it are not nice people, but they are spiritual people. They just haven't connected. If you want to say, you know, they haven't connected that part. That's fine. But I think we have to look at what they've done. And that's the history that we're talking about. Yeah, I don't disagree with any of that, Alex. I don't, I don't disagree with any of that. And, and I'm, I'm certainly not uh, sugarcoating the, I mean, you know, I talk, about, I talk about a lot of bad things in that book. And, you know, you talk about abusing children. That is going on systematically, right? Uh, and it's not... And we shouldn't call it pedophile either because the root of that is like you know love it's molestation abuse you know uh, uh, rape so um and it's systematic and it's been systematically covered up so i'm not denying any of that and i would say that is connected to this story as well i don't you know go down that path I, I don't tend to gravitate towards talking about that, but I talk about Nazi Germany in that book. And I talk about, um, I talk about the things that, the, the things that were done in, to the native Americans uh, to, in Central America, in India. I mean, it, it, in it, Rome, still going on in yeah, Rome. Absolutely. So, and, uh, so yeah, I mean, the 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 problem of evil is certainly and, and the myths don't deny that i mean the myths are actually very brutal and um explicit and bizarre in many ways and you have gods who are capricious and you have gods who are malevolent and you have gods who just you've got you know just going to the greek myths which are very familiar to a lot of people you've got Athena, and she is a war goddess in, in a sense. She wears a helmet. She's got a spear. She's for justice. And then there's Ares, and he's a war god, and he's completely different. He's like, who can I stab in the guts right now? Because I just feel like seeing some intestines flow out right now. I'm in that kind of a mood right now. And it's a completely different. And Athena is always getting angry with Ares. And they're, you know, they're constantly kind of bringing their battles in front of Zeus. But there are malevolent um, entities throughout the myths. And, and uh, you know, I've, I've written, you know, you, you mentioned my blog. I've, I've now been doing it for over 10 years. There's over 1,300 posts. And there's one in there where I'm talking about there's this um, a gentleman who, who channels the guides. And he's so able to, he says it so fast. He's talking so fast. He's hearing it from 
And I ask the question, is that from outside himself or inside himself? And, and the answer I say is, I don't know, but actually I don't think it matters. The gods work their way out through men and women, whether they're external or internal, whether, whether Athena is inside of Odysseus's head when she's talking to him or she's you know, in a different dimension. I'm not the expert on that. I'm, I can show you that the myths are based on the stars. So they're not literal. They're talking about metaphor. I do believe that they're talking about the infinite realm. And that's one of the reasons they use the stars. When we're looking up into the stars, we're looking into an infinite realm. And they're using the visible aspects to paint a picture about invisible truths. That's all going on. And I've, I've talked about that extensively. So um, I do think it would be good to show, you know, just, <laughs> I don't know if we're, we're at the end of the show, but uh, to show some of the actual, to show what was lost. And we can jump into Josephus at any point, but I would like to just show, because it'll show when we talk about Mithraism, then you'll have a framework to put it into when I say that's all celestial. That was imposed by people who understood this ancient system. At the same time, they're smashing the ancient system. They're using it for their benefit. And, and, and it'll make sense if I show you the slides, because then, then people can go, aha, everything that, let, let me go back and start again at the beginning, because now what he's saying makes sense that it's all based on the stars. And I'm going to share my screen. I'll move through this kind of fast, because I know you want to get to some Josephus. But this really helps. And I chose some things from ancient Greece for you. But this is actually a Maya cup. I started with a Maya cup. This is, I think, so <laughs> powerful. Uh, this was brought to my attention by someone commenting on one of my YouTube videos. It said, hey, this, this Maya cup looks like it's got the same thing going on. I see in my animation, I didn't get rid of that one line. Sorry, I'll, I'll get to that later. But there's all the data. You can see this in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. This is from the 7th and 8th century AD in, or CE, if you prefer, from Maya. This is a rain god whose name is Chalk. He's a rain god of the Maya. He's well known. They have you know glyphs that say his name, so we know that that's Chalk. Look at his posture. He's got a lunge posture, rear heel raised. I'm just going to go through it really fast. Some people have heard this before, but it's really powerful when you see it. He's holding a weapon. This weapon is kind of over his back. It's an ax. I've drawn an arrow to it. That squiggly line is supposed to come in later. I apologize that it's still there on the screen. That's my drawing. It's not in the artwork. He's also got another arm. There's one over his back with a weapon, in this case an ax. Other one's reaching forward. It's actually grasping this circular kind of disc thing. Then he's also got this loincloth that he's wearing around his waist. And there's this long tuft that kind of comes out. I've circled it there, but that's that tuft right there at the end is important. Just note that. Here's just moving really quickly. Obviously, artwork from a different culture, a different century, a different continent. This is ancient Greece. This is Zeus, the great god Zeus. We know it's Zeus, the ancient artist, or at least the ancient artist's friend who could write Zeus has written the name there. So we know it's Zeus. Look at the same posture we've got. And this is from 540 BC or thereabouts. We've got, again, the rear, this big lunge, rear heel raised. He's got one arm over his head holding a weapon. In this case, it's a thunderbolt. But he's also got this outstretched front arm. Zeus's son, Hercules, almost always depicted in this posture. Same rear heel and weapon over head. In this case, the vase kind of curves away, so you can't see exactly what he's wielding, but it's probably his favorite weapon, which is a club. And he's got this outstretched arm, and it's near the crest. He's fighting the Amazon warrior women in this one of his 12 labors of Hercules. But you see grasping or nearly grasping something kind of circular or semicircular. And look at that little tail on his. I've put one more arrow. You see that tail? of his lion skin. Hercules is almost always depicted in a lion skin with a thing over his head. See the tuft of the lion's tail right there? Notice the similarity to chalk, and I'll show it again. Here's a, one more of Hercules. This time he's in a, a different battle, but he's got that rear heel raised. He's got one arm holding the weapon over his back. In this case, uh, there's that lion's tail with a little tuft. It's pretty it's kind of like artsy looking. This is kind of looks almost like art deco period of ancient Greece. But uh, in this case, Hercules is actually grasping 
the crest of his opponent's helmet. I'm going to blow it up so that people can see it on their screen a little bit bigger. Roop. There's the same painting. You can see his hand right there grasping the crest. Can you see that his hand is grasping the crest? Look at Chalk. He's grasping a disc. Look at Hercules. He's grasping a crest. Why? Because this is the constellation Hercules. Sorry, that squiggly line is not part of the constellation. That's supposed to come in as a big reveal later, but my animation skills somehow missed that. Um, but this is the constellation, the outline of the constellation called Hercules in the sky. Actually, it looks a little like Curious George. Um, this is the H.A. Ray outline of Hercules. Now, near Hercules, there's this beautiful arc called the Northern Crown, but in Latin, it's actually called Corona. That's Corona Borealis, the Northern Crown, the Crown of the North. Look at where it is in relative, look at Hercules. He's got the rear heel, he's got the lunge posture, he's got a weapon over one side, he's reaching out with the other hand, and the other hand could be envisioned as grasping Corona Borealis. Now let's go back to chalk. See, look, I didn't, I didn't change the outline of Hercules, I didn't change chalk, on the Maya cup that was found in the Americas, nowhere near Greece. And I could show you this from around the world. I could show you this from India with their rain god, Indra, who wields the Vajra weapon, which is like Zeus's thunderbolt. Zeus is also a storm god. Chalk is a storm god. Look at what he's grasping. He's grasping the Northern crown. And by the way, there's this very bright star named Vega. That's what the squiggly line is pointing to. That's the tuft of Hercules's tail. That's the the tuft of chalks uh, loincloth i'm going fast but hopefully this makes sense to people that is the star vega it's the fifth brightest star in the sky it's that it's right there next to hercules and this beautiful piece of artwork i'm, I'm going to get now we're going to go to josephus in a second i know you're chomping at the bit to get to josephus and maybe we have to save some of it for another time but this was only found in 2017 this is called the pylos combat agate it was found in pylos on the western peloponnese in greece but it was from a tomb that was sealed up and undisturbed since 1500 bc it's very ancient this is way before classical greece which was like 500 bc um, this is the tomb was sealed up in 1500 BC. Who knows when this Pylos agate was made? It could have been made 100 or 200 years before that, for all we know. It's only 3.5 centimeters wide, which I could spend an hour talking about. Look at the detail. How did they do this? But let's look at the celestial elements. We've got an exaggerated lunge posture very clearly. We've got the raised heel. We've got the old sword or weapon arm over the back. And then we've got the other arm reaching out. And what's it doing? It's grasping another circular crest of a helmet that they've put onto this amazing piece of art, which was only uncovered in 2017. They found this tomb, but it's Corona Borealis. There, there's no doubt in my mind that this is based on the stars because I've seen it a million times. Before 2017, I'd already pointed this out, and then this thing gets uncovered in 2017. And by the way, do you see that this warrior who's about to stab the other warrior has a sword? Uh, scabbard on his waist with a pommel right there. See that bulb of a pommel? That's indicating the position of Vega again. The, the stars are all in the right places. This is clearly based on the stars. And you could say, but, but that doesn't mean the Bible is based on the stars. The Bible doesn't have pictures, it's text. All the things that they're describing in the Bible can be shown to be using this same system. This system is worldwide. I just showed you in, you know, the Maya and in Greece, and I could show you from Egypt, I could show you from Mesopotamia. It is worldwide, and it's all through the Bible. This is a shared system that should actually unite us all, um, but it's the literalist Christianity. So how did, let's, oh, that's, that's what happened to my squiggly thing. So let me just, this is Gobekli Tepe. I'm just going to put it up on the timeline as, it was deliberately buried not later than 8,000 BC, only recently uncovered. I just want to put a framework together and then we'll get into what happened. That's what's been lost. When did it get lost? Roman period. We've already been talking about that for an hour. Here's ancient Egypt. It's like civilization emerges out of nowhere around 3,500 BC in places like Mesopotamia, in places like ancient India, ancient Mesopotamia, ancient China, 
in the Americas, there was stuff going on in this time period as Graham Hancock has recently shown evidence, advanced things going on. And then there's the Roman period. This is Marcus Aurelius, who I think is like one of the last good guys, frankly. But there's Marcus Aurelius, 121 to 180. That's the father of Commodus that you see in that movie. Um, Commodus was, according to the theory that I argue about in the book, that it was originally proposed by Flavio Barbiero. He's an Italian retired admiral. He's written a whole 500-page book about this theory of Josephus. And Commodus, who may or may not have killed his father, Marcus Aurelius, was the first soul invictus Mithras practitioner who got into the office of emperor. So just, I'll stop in one second and, and pause. I think there was a time, a very ancient time, there's very ancient wisdom. Whenever this system was set up, I think there was quite likely a catastrophe. You know, you hear people talk about the comet impact theory, younger Dryas impact theory, or Robert Schock talks about uh, extreme solar uh, storm, like a coronal mass ejection or, or solar activity that wipes out whatever created this system. And then humanity almost basically goes underground or lives in caves for a long time. And then it just reemerges in the time of Egypt, Mesopotamia, ancient India, et cetera. And I call that ancient wisdom. So there's something even before, because this was already fully formed in the myths of India, already fully formed in the myths of ancient Egypt. So it came from somewhere before. I'm just laying out kind of, I think the timeline was, there was a catastrophe, probably a natural catastrophe, a comet or something that wiped it out. Then civilizations arose that still remembered it. They still had pieces of it. Ancient Greece obviously still had pieces of it. But then there was another catastrophe in the Roman period. And since then, this ancient, even the ancient wisdom, whatever was left over after the catastrophe, has been forgotten or deliberately stamped out. That kind of breaks it into three pieces, which I think is a helpful framework. So I interviewed a guy a uh, few, I don't know, probably a year ago at this point. His name is uh, Bruce Fenton. Fantastic. Uh -huh. Love him. And his, and his wife, too, together wrote this book. And they have some really good um, evidence for... Uh, 780,000 years ago. Mm, yeah, I've heard that. Yeah, and it's 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 really good. He has the tectites, in, and then he has the genetic information, and he has all the rest of that. So that's like a stake in the ground for me. I look at his work, spent a lot of time looking at his work, spent a lot of time putting the, the movie together and that whole thing. Mm -hmm. Very solid, how you look at it. 780,000 yeah. years ago. So yeah. that that doesn't so when I hear people talk about it, when I hear you talk about go, go, what is it? Go, Gobekli Tepe, yeah. Go Gobekli Tepe. Tepe. I always I always stumble on that. Go Gobekli Tepe. Ah, great. How does that fit in the 780,000 year kind of thing? And similarly, when I hear, you know, the Romans stamped it out, you know, it's like, eh, I don't know, a lot of different people you know, a lot of people don't like Genghis Khan. Some people in some parts of the world love Genghis Khan. You know, it's a, it, there's a lot of different shit going on, you know, at, at any time. And it's like, this should unite us all. When you say that, it's like, no, I don't, I don't come to that same conclusion. I come to the conclusion that we're all leading rich spiritual lives that are meaningful to us. And that the people who are, you know, involved in a, satanic ritual abuse cult in grand rapids michigan who are abusing their four-year-old kids i don't know what their spirituality is but i believe that they're on some sort of spiritual journey and maybe some point in their life in this lifetime they will like we're saying you know look up see the light and be transformed or maybe they won't and maybe their children will or maybe they won't so i'm just not willing to I, I just not willing to accept it should be meaningful to all of us. It should pull all of us together. I don't, I, it sounds good, but I don't know if that is true or it isn't true. I just got done interviewing two of the top in history, near death experience researchers, uh, Bruce Grace and Jeff Long. And I'm interviewing another NDE guy that, um, 
that everybody knows, Evan Alexander. Go look at the near-death experience research and the database that have been put together, all the accounts that have been put together and have been reviewed medically and all the rest of that. I think it's enormously significant for what we're saying about, it's about love, it's about forgiveness, it's about compassion. That's what it's about. But people have very different experiences in their journey there. And it sure looks, and then go talk to Gregory Shushan, who's looked at near-death experiences across culture, across time as best he could, 600 years ago, 500 years ago. His conclusion is near-death experiences are the foundation for all afterlife beliefs, because there's the same thread in all of them. So I'm down with everything that you're saying. I'm just not down with your conclusions about it. I'm not against your conclusions about it, but I, I just, I'm not willing to say, oh, okay, that's the answer. What I want to do is keep pulling on the threads and look at, you know, pull apart what, what happened as best we could, realizing that we're, we're all disadvantaged in the vantage point that we're looking at it for. Because, you know, the other, that's the other thing, you know, the last point, and then I'll stop my long rant. One of the things that your work teaches us that I, I, we can never fully grok, you know, we can never fully get there, is that we are by our nature unable to understand this. Because we, it's telling us that there is a much greater in every, you know, near-death experience is telling us this, alien abduction is telling us, all this telling us, there's an expanded consciousness and you're not there. You know, you're on the other side of it. And yet we all want to look, and that's our human nature, we want to look and try and understand the best we can. But what I hear over and over again is, you're not, you know, you're kind of like the dog, you know, who I just the foster dog we have out there who's wonderful and she's beautiful, but she doesn't really get me, you know, fully. What do you think about any of that since we just kind of go all over the place? <laughs> well, dogs definitely don't process exactly the same way we do. But, um, you know, the uh, I'm not going to argue about some of the some of those points. Look, what I what I often say is I can prove that the myths are based on the stars. I think I just showed some evidence that, you know, if people maybe <laughs> if I went too fast, they can watch it a few, slow it down, maybe and say, what did he just say? What star was that? Mm, OK, but that evidence is pretty powerful. I can prove that now where it came from. What it means, I have opinions about that. I don't have I'm not a, you know, uh, a guru or uh, privy to, you know, I don't hold myself up as an ascended master who's been given some special knowledge to now proclaim to you. Um, I've got some opinions about where it came from and what happened, but could it have come from, I have heard Bruce Fenton on a podcast uh, interviewed and talking about his research. Um, I haven't examined it myself, but um could when i say the very ancient wisdom how far back does that go and where exactly did it come from and we've talked about this in our previous uh, episode i don't know i can show you that the myths are based on the stars what does it mean i don't know but i've got a lot of uh, arguments as to what it means that i think are backed up by pretty good textual evidence pretty good interpretive of the myths evidence the part about this should unite us all. What I'm, I mean, just to take it to its most simplest level, what I'm talking about is literalist Christianity has said, our stories are based on history. Everything else is wrong. And therefore you need to get rid of what was given to you and adopt what we're telling you. These stories were given to all cultures of the world, whether that is intended to unite or not we could argue, but we won't get anywhere because I'm not an expert one way or the other. I believe they're like an ancient treasure that is for our benefit, that is to get us, because we're disconnected from ourself. They show you, and that is the biggest problem that we have, that we are trying to find who we are. I use that, I use the point break where Johnny is searching for something and Bodhi 
point pokes him in the forehead and says, you, you, you haven't figured it out yet. Have you surfing, you know, surfing is where the place where you find yourself and you lose yourself and you don't know it, but you've got it right there. And he taps him in the third eye bump. Um, that's what we're looking for to find ourselves, but to lose the, those to anyway, not to get too, uh, you know, dive into yeah, the but, navel, but, but, to, but I'm talking about, it should unite us from this idea that one set of myths needs to go out and stamp out everybody else's inherited wisdom that they got. And that has happened over the past 17 centuries and continues to go on. And that's a problem because the myths of the Maya are based on the exact same system as the stories in the Bible. And they both are actually telling you the same things just with different stories and characters and, and they're absolutely pointing to the same truth, I would argue. And so you don't need to get rid of any of them. Do, do you know who uh, Michael Aquino on. is? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> major Aquino? Yeah, is Major. About? Uh, military guy. I forgot that. Yeah, I think military. he was Lieutenant Colonel. Yeah, he's now yeah. deceased. Yeah. Now deceased just recently, and he was the head of the Temple of Sad. He was a Satanist. That's right. He That's wrote right. the chaplain's manual for all the chaplain. If you're Christian, you're yeah. Muslim. It's his, yeah. a psyop guy from the beginning. Yeah, he was in a, in a he, serial serial abuser of children. I think by pretty uh, in most pretty, 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 in pretty the most clear, horrific horrific yeah. way with uh, in very very uh, satanic way with you know yeah. altars and you know mixing in of all kinds of spiritual stuff and then abusing and probably we suspect killing kids but the evidence of his abuse is direct testimony direct evidence against him and you know anyone can go do that so somebody tapped him on the forehead too and said you're trying to figure it out and he figured it out it was satan it was some evil malevolent being that guided him and it turns out his 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 mother was into it Turns out his grandfather was into it in a different way, and his grandfather committed suicide, eventually slit his own throat and bled to death. Somebody tapped him on the forehead too. Didn't have anything to do with the myths. They weren't tied into the myths. They were on a different plane and a different thing. So I don't know how all these things fit together, but I just, I, I just hate when it gets to like, this is the way that we gotta, we gotta look. I mean, I think it's like, I don't know what influenced uh, Constant. Constantine is the figure, you know, if we ever get back to that. Constantine's a great, you know, the great Saint Constantine. You know the story I always remember remind people. Constantine killed his son because he thought his son was fucking his wife. His wife said, said hey, man, your son, he's, I don't know how to keep him off me. He's coming on to me all the time. He's right there, you know. He kills him. Then he finds out that his wife, and this is after he converted to Christianity, right? <laughs> right? Then he, fi then he finds out that, oh, his wife actually made that up because she wanted her son from another marriage to get in there and that he was in the way and da 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 da. So he kills her, right? Which, however you process that. But that is the founder of this cult that we have that, you know, the Christian cult which just replaced the cult of mithras it's just an exact like carbon copy stick in the different pieces and wrap it up and call it something different the thing i learned from your book you know for 60 years in the the what the the what becomes the yeah tell that tell that part yeah well let me react to what you said though first about michael aquino um so what I would point to, and I point to it in the book, but it's really one of my favorite examples. And it's in the scriptures of first Kings where Solomon is on top of a mountain making sacrifices and they're pleasing to the almighty. And God says, Solomon, ask, ask me anything. What do you want? Whatever you want. And Solomon says, you know, I've been made King over these people so many people and yet i feel kind of like a little child in terms of my understanding i'm 
concerned that I'm screwing up right and left as I'm trying to judge these different cases that are brought to me. Give me a wise and understanding heart in order to judge the people rightly. And the text says that response pleased the Lord. Now, pause. We find that exact pattern in myths around the world. We find King Midas is asked by Dionysus, Dionysus, thanks for returning my drinking buddy to me when he got lost. Ask me anything. What do you want? What does Midas say? <laughs> I want everything I touch to turn to gold. Okay. Or we have, um, you know, we have that pattern over and over. Um, choose what you want. And going back to the Solomon incident, God says, the text says, that answer pleased the Lord. And he said to Solomon, you could have asked for long life. You could have asked for riches. You could have asked for the life of your enemies. It specifically says the life of your enemies, but you asked for wisdom to help the people. So I'm going to give you wisdom to help the people, and I'm also going to give you long life and riches. Now, that implies that the you can go to the invisible realm, or you can go to the what the myths are pointing towards. I would call it the other world, the invisible world, the inner world, the dream time. You can go there for many different, and you can get many different things from there. And we see this pattern over and over. What do you want? What do you want from the invisible realm? What do you want from the divine realm? Riches, Midas, wrong choice. And it turns out very badly for Midas. He has to eventually say, I made the terrible choice. Can you please undo this choice? I'm going to die if I keep eating uh, golden hot dogs. They're going to kill me. So he undoes it. The, 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 the divine realm undoes it. But Solomon could have asked for the life of his enemies. He could have used the divine realm for not just power over his enemies, but to kill his enemies or to bring harm to them. That's what the text implies to me. You can use it for different things, but the correct thing is for wisdom in order to live up to your potential and to help others. That's, that's what Solomon asked for. He said, I want wisdom, not just so I can be the wisest person in the world, but to help others with all the problems that they have. So I would argue that what Aquino was doing, and I talk about it in this same book, Myth and Trauma, I talk about Crowley. Crowley was searching for his higher self. And he, when he took on his magician persona, he was taking on this other, Crowley was a very uh, evil figure, right? And Aquino was a very evil figure. You can use this for different things, but the original purpose is pretty clearly stated as it's for wisdom to help others. It's not for chasing after riches, Midas. Come on, Midas, figure it out. You're already the richest king in the world. Why do you need more riches? What's your problem? What's wrong with you inside that you are still not satisfied as the king of Phrygia, who is already, since you were a child, it was predicted that you're going to be the richest man in the world. And yet when I come to you and offer you anything, you want to turn everything to gold. Okay, have fun. There's something wrong inside that you're still so insecure, you need more gold. So anyway, that's my response to Aquino uh, being on a spiritual quest. Yeah, and you can, you can use it for the, you can use it for those things, but that's not the right thing and that's not the, the that's not the the beneficial way to use it because it's going to destroy you like it destroyed Midas you, you know one of the things I can. one of the things I'm, I'm kind of keen on these days is to tell people that you know this amazing database of near-death experiences that Dr. Jeff Long has and his wife Jody have compiled and they're medically reviewed and they're carefully done through this long survey that kind of weeds out. It's a clean database. I just did an extensive database. I, I did an extensive interview with the guy and the main purpose of the interview was to say, is your data reliable? Are you filtering it? Are you in any ways? So it is, it is. I always tell people, go Google N-D-E-R-F, Near Death Experience Research Foundation. Love, Jesus, God, you know, any of those things, anything you want, but then go do Crowley, go do Satan, go do do what thou wilt, go do magic, go do all that. It doesn't, you know how much, you know how many times that comes up? Zero. Love comes up all the time, right? Over the top. Compassion comes up 
all the time. Forgiveness comes up all the time. Uh, but so in a way, you know, we always get into these ecclesiastic <laughs> debates, no matter what we, we set out to do. To me, David, it's a different, they are t the near-death experience accounts are telling a slightly different story. They're telling the difference of the story of truly all you have to do is seek love and compassion on one hand versus kind of your story has kind of a Gnostic feel to it. Like there's this battle, you know, and there's these two kind of things. The, the, the near-death experience accounts are really kind of saying something different. Ah, there, there's a battle, but you really kind of created the whole battle. You know, it's just really all you have to do is just seek love in, in everything you do. And, and we're actually in agreement on that. But where we kind of always slip up is that I don't think that captures what you just said. I don't think that captures Aquino. Aquino, I guess it is. Yeah, maybe and, it is, yeah. And it's like... You know, I just watched, uh, and I'd hate to even watching these things, but somebody get stuck into them on um, Ted Bundy, and uh, he's talking about his experience and him growing up and how he just had this kind of, just a little, almost understandable attraction to a certain kind of porn, you know, and it just kind of grew and it just kind of grew, and eventually it became what he felt was an entity inside of him, a spiritual entity that was battling with his soul. And well, we all know the story of what happens to that. I'm just reluctant to, you know, I, I don't, so I don't know what any of these things mean. So I'm just plowing ahead. You're plowing ahead too. I mean, you do the same thing. You're just plowing ahead with your thing. Like you just said it, you know, we'll wind up just, we'll each wind up saying the same thing over again. And I'm with you. You know, the myths are reflected in the stars. There's no way that that Mayan thing completely matches the constellation. And what's the name of the constellation? Hercules. <laughs> Fucking Hercules. Fucking yeah. Hercules, right? Which is like. We're going to have to curse the constellation, Alex. Come on. Yeah. Now. Well, it's the, uh, that's your Christian lineage popping in there <laughs> it's it's like it's from a completely different culture there's the, the name itself is all we have to say that guy matches up to the constellation and the constellation has gotten the name hercules i mean it, yeah. it's there's no end doubt. of story there's in no terms doubt. of your whole there's thing no doubt and so it's interesting that you said I'm, i feel kind of gnostic and and the the part that we that you kind of started off on of all you need is love you know i am not actually saying let's just um connect with our higher self and kind of meditate and, you know, the Aquinos of the world or Aquinos will do their thing. I actually believe that things have gone very wrong, <laughs> that, that, that people who want to inflict trauma, you know, you can, you can build a society that's less traumatic or more traumatic. And there are people who want to deliberately inflict trauma. And I think those people need to be stopped. And I think they are, uh, they've they've gotten control of the levers of a lot of places, including, you know, look, we had a lot of assassinations in this country, including of an elected president. And then Robert F. Kennedy, his brother, when he was about to get the nomination and was for sure going to become the president, and he got assassinated, too. You have the levers of power being. Oh, it didn't stop there, right? It's Reagan. That Reagan was attempted, you know, that he got the message. And then, you know, the story I always had to people is Jimmy Carter, remember when they attempted him? And the uh, assassins were, uh, I want to get this right, it's like something Harvey and Oswald, this and that. They took the two, uh, the, the CIA said, hey, we figured out who the two assassins were. And if you just take the t two names together, they were uh, Harvey Oswald, like, get the message here. We're pulling this. And then, uh, uh, Carter comes out and says, I've lost control of the government after that. So just to add to your, th that is the same group. So, so it is, yeah. So, so I would say, you know, it, we have to, um, we have to work on our own individual <laughs> getting in, getting in touch with ourselves, get re reconnecting with who we are. Cause that's a huge part of our mission, but there's also people who are inflicting trauma on the world that are enemies of humanity that need to be stopped. So, uh, you know, I'm not just Gnostic, uh, 
<laughs> withdraw into withdraw into a hermitage. I think that these are things that the people need to. I believe in giving the power to the people, all the power to all the people. So, um, uh, <laughs> I was gonna I was gonna add one other thing on there, but this is a story that has to do with the taking away of what belongs, what's given, what's given to the people in their ancient myths and the resources of the gods that are given to the people, the people that are born into the land are allowed to be born into the land by the people. This is a story of the, the collaborators, the conspirators against that. Okay. We're a, a hour and 49 we're, minutes we're, in. We're let's tell time. them what yeah. let's no, no, no. Let's. <laughs> so now is now we've set the stage. Yeah. Let's tell them, tell them what happened. Tell them. Oh, you want to, you want to, you want to drive on? Yes, I, I want to, but I want you to do it in 10 minutes. I All want right. you to tell them, tell them what happened. Tell them how they did it. Tell them the, the, the short story of the cult of Mithras and how they made it, how they made it work and how Josephus played a role in it and Vespasian. Let me, let me, let me do it with some visuals too. And I'll keep it to under 10 minutes. Visual aids good? Of Visual course. aids better? Of yeah, course, right. of course. whatever whatever you want. All right, let me share screen. All right, so here's Titus Arch in Rome. Arch of Titus, 81 CE, built by his younger brother, who, whom you've already mentioned, Domitian, after... Do you think Domitian Titus killed died. him? I don't know. Um, I, I don't know. I'm agnostic on that one. But, but uh, Titus, just, just so people know... Just so people know, Titus said, years, yeah. "I only made one mistake, and that was there was a, there was a, a a plot, and it was tied to his brother. And instead of killing his brother Domitian, he banished him. And then a year later, he gets assassinated. He said, "I only made one mistake." It's compelling. There was a lot of assassinations going on. Uh, you know, we just mentioned a couple in the United States, and you can add Martin Luther King in there, and you can add Malcolm X, you can add Fred Hampton. And I would say that that same pattern, there's a reason why that pattern is connected. Um, the use of assassination, obviously it's worldwide, but this is this group uh, does it a lot. So Arch of Titus, I've got a slide with all the Roman emperors to just put it into people's perspective. But I, I started here, you can see on the inside of the Arch of Titus right here, this is the sack of Jerusalem. This is the fall of the temple. This is where Josephus comes into the picture. This is on the side, you can see they're carrying off the temple treasures in the, uh, there was a revolt in Judea starting in 66 a, uh, AD 66 or 66 CE. Vespasian was the general who was sent to, to put down the revolt. He had two sons that were with him on this. Uh, well, Titus was his, like his main lieutenant on this military operation, Titus that you just mentioned possibly being killed by his brother Domitian. But this is the Arch of Titus. So Vespasian um, went there and was putting down the revolt. Josephus was, by his own admission, a member of the revolt. In fact, a leader of the revolt. In fact, a son of a priest of the priestly lineage of the temple and very, you know, uh, supreme pedigree Josephus um, surrendered to Vespasian. And we can go into that story, but since we only have 10 minutes, um, this, is not, this is not unknown history. You can look all this up. The people who were writing about this in the 1800s, I have leaned heavily on the work of Flavio Barbiero. I do not agree with every single thing that Flavio Barbiero has to say, but he has tons of evidence to argue for what Josephus did. And that's what we're primarily talking about here. Barbiero treats Moses as if Moses is a historical figure. I believe Moses is a constellation. I can show you that Moses is a constellation. I can show you that John the Baptist is a constellation. I can show you that Jesus is a constellation, series of constellations. But the, uh, the, the temple was ransacked. Nobody denies that. And it was burned to the ground. But the treasures were taken out. We can see it right here on the Arch of Titus. That's a very important piece of evidence. That's Vespasian. That's the father of the... Well, well, hold on, hold on, because you're just yeah. you're you're just to think about. I've, I've already said this a bunch of times, so people might get tired of it. This is like a really key point that you were making. Is that yeah, they sacked the city, yeah, they burned it down, and yeah, they took all the loot, 
And yeah, this is what I got from Dave Brody, who uh, I told you wrote the book Romerica. And mm -hmm. he traces this thing happening again 60 years later when the Ninth Legion is called in to put down the next revolt in Judea mm -hmm. in 130, and they walk away with a ton of loot. And the, the better reading, I think, of this story is that Josephus knew where the gold was. Because you think about it, you're under siege for 90 days. You're a military guy. Do you, do you just sit there and say, okay, leave all the gold right there <laughs> out in the open. If they get through that door, they get all the gold. Hell no, you go and bury it, right? That's what people have done throughout time. You bury it, you hide it. That's why and when you watch that show, Oak Island, they're still digging for the buried gold. They buried it. The Jews right. buried it. And Josephus said, I'll tell you what, he didn't, the, the story, again, it's so miserably stupid to say that the reason that Vespasian put him in the townhouse, gave him, gave free passage to 200 of his uh, uh, best friends and had him That's write right. all the history was because he did a prophecy of, you know, he, he did a right. fortune telling for him. What nonsense. What he did was he said, I'll lead you to the gold. I know where the gold is at and nobody else does. Well, and that's why I was saying, look, Josephus was very high up in the hierarchy. And this is what Flavio Barbiero argues. Uh, you know, in the 1800s, 1700s, there have been scholars who said Josephus was the biggest traitor of all time. Now, there are modern scholars who are pushing back against that, but um, I think they're probably trying to cover up what Josephus did because this is the points you're making are all absolutely uh supported by the evidence and i'll show you some of the evidence and i talk about the evidence in this book and also in the undying stars which was 2014 but here's vespasian so as you mentioned so he was the general who was he lived from 9 ce to 79 ce he led that first campaign to put down and then the rebellion and then titus his son so he he became emperor after the the the, the temple was sacked in ad 70 very important to just know that date. Here's Titus. He lived from 39 to 81. He was the one who basically, you know, they, they said, how come this rebellion has, we've put them down with Vespasian's army. How come they won't give up? You know what? I think we're going to uh, besiege the temple and then they'll give up. You know, if they see that we're, you know, we got, we've got the military machine of Rome camped outside the temple. You're not getting out. And if, if you don't give up, we'll burn it down. Do you want to give up? Well, apparently the answer was no. But as you point out, Josephus had already surrendered to Vespasian and gone back to Rome. And, and, and then he came back with Titus. This, uh, Josephus and Titus are about the same age. Here's Josephus. I put his name upside down. He's a, he's a traitor. He's like a Benedict Arnold to his people. He lived from 37 to 100. So you can see that he and Titus are basically the same age. He and Titus, so he surrendered. He has this big story in his accounts where, well, we were all surrounded at Jotapata or Yodpat. Um, we, we were surrounded by the Romans, but we didn't want to give up. So we decided we would all commit suicide. So we would each kill one another. We'd draw our swords and we'd, we'd just pair up and kill each other. We'd draw lots to see who would go first. And then everyone killed each other, except for me and my guy. We decided not to kill each other. And uh, because I had a vision that Vespasian was going to become the emperor. And I came out and I told him, you know, I've been told uh, our scriptures actually say that you're going to be the emperor. And, uh, and so therefore Vespasian then eventually becomes the emperor and loves Josephus so much for telling him that, that he, as you said, gives him his old villa that he used to live in, gives him an annuity for the rest of his life, a stipend. He'll get paid for the rest of his life. He won't have to pay taxes. He gets to take on the name Titus Flavius. He becomes a freedman. Well, as you've argued in it, uh, just a minute ago, and as other people have argued, there's got to be more to the story. Titus knew where the treasure was. Vespasian, these emperors or these generals were always having to keep their troops fed and paid if they wanted them to keep fighting for them in order to take over the empire, which is what Vespasian And especially Vespasian, right? Vespasian was kind of the soldier's general. He kind of knew, he understood the psychology of the soldier in that way, right? 
So there's absolutely he was a, he was a, these guys were competent military leaders and he he used that he was running out of money in Egypt in campaigns in Egypt and anyway the the theory is that he that, so Titus and Josephus during that siege the the treasure had been buried in various hiding places and Josephus and Titus dug it out and and that's how Vespasian was able to pay the troops to continue to stay loyal to him long enough to march on Rome and take over and defeat all the other challengers to be the emperor, because I'll show you, it was tumultuous times. No, no, that's, was, that's hugely significant. And, and I know I said 10 minutes, there's no way. Well, we're rushing. That's what, well, hold, hold on. Because <laughs> there's it. a couple of points there that I think are, are super significant. Well, and it's always kind of react to this idea that uh, Josephus was a traitor to his people. Um, sure. Yeah, I mean, he's, I mean, that's kind of undeniable in that he's Jewish and he's this kind of elitist Jewish guy. But the the other thing that you said, I can even edit that out because that's stupid. It doesn't matter. The other thing that you said I think is super important is what he writes, because to me, this is the beginning of the PSYOP in action, the beginning of the social engineering in action. He writes that, hey, you know what? not just the prophecy that just that of Vespasian is going to be emperor he says the people of Judea and he's speaking of them as if he's not one of them one of the reasons they were so mad at the Romans was they thought that the Romans went against this prophecy that someone from their own soil would rise up to be the leader and they said you know what they kind of misread it a little bit. And I should know because I'm a super Jew. Like you said, I'm elitist. I've gone to the temple and know the law. And I now see what the law really said. And the law said, Vespasian is our Messiah, the Jewish Messiah. And the reason this is so important is from, and you can say, well, that's a failed thing. It never worked out that way. But what they were trying to do, and this goes back once we said two hours ago, uh, in my opinion, not all these things work. I think this is a failed psyop. They said, hey, let's try this. Maybe we can get the Jews to kind of come over to our side if we can convince them that their Messiah is really Vespasian. And the Jews don't really respond to that because there's all these other in the Bible, there's all these prophecies that would have to be met for that to happen. But still, it was an attempt to do that. And I think that's significant, particularly as you go on in the story in terms of how it plays out, because they keep trying to play this social engineering game. Do, or first, do you have any any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, it's certainly it's, you know, it's more than a, <laughs> it's certainly more than a 10 minute conversation. But I don't actually. So, you know, Joe Atwill, I've read his book you know, several times and I heard him speak. And that I is not, I, well, it, yeah, everything I, I, okay. I just said has nothing to do with that. Well, okay. But uh, so I don't believe that, um, the Josephus, you know, wrote the gospels. I think these were ancient stories that were updated because we need to write it, four of them. It, yeah. if, if you want to pause and I don't think we should, I will, but I already sent you the exact quote from war of the Jews where yeah. Josephus says, yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Those, those are good points. Those are, those are good points. What I'm saying is that I believe that Josephus. Well, I guess I'm not. I'm not arguing with that as a possibility. What you're saying, I'm not, I'm not arguing with that. I'm just. I'm trying to clarify that I don't think that the Gospels. If if. I don't think that the stories of the New Testament. See, I'm not going were, there. We're, we're just going to cloud the water. Josephus. We're okay, just going to so, cloud okay. the water with that. Fair enough. So Be let because me, I'll just leave that aside. Okay. I I think my point actually aligns perfectly with what you're going to say about the Mithras Solavicus is okay. that, you know, here, here is a pattern of we can do this. Let's try this. Let's try. So it's like a first attempt at, you know, it's let's try global warming. Global warming doesn't work. Oh, this pandemic thing. Let's see if we can get that to get to our new world order kind of thing. This is the first attempt. But when you say, when you say, I'm a super Jew, and that's what Josephus says he is, and he says, you know what? Quirky little thing has happened here. You guys just kind of slightly misread the prophecy. The prophecy, because there's a tricky little part in here. What Josephus writes is like, look, you guys weren't stupid. 
you understood the prophecy, but what you didn't get is that little part where it said Jewish soil and, the, and our soil. Well, it turns out, quirk of, quirk of history, Vespasian was named emperor when he was in Judea. So that actually fulfills the prophecy. When a guy is spinning it that hard, to me, that can't, that's not accidental. It's an attempt to really, you know. Yeah, yeah. so we're not, we're actually not disagreeing. So I, I jumped in with just a cautionary that, you know, I like Joe Atwell, but I don't agree with all of his things because sometimes that could come in. But that absolutely, Josephus is the most unreliable source. And yet he's relied on as, well, we have this, here's our sources for, yes, you know, yes. for the Dead Sea Scroll era. Well, we've got the Dead Sea Scrolls now, but before that, all we had was Josephus and the New Testament. And I'm saying, well, <laughs> you can't use either of those as history, because basically they're both based on the stars. I can show you that when Josephus was writing about this or that battle, he's using the same system. He's talking about, well, they were speared like fish. Well, that's funny. Here's a passage in the Odyssey where Odysseus's men were speared like fish. I mean, Josephus was well read in ancient literature, and he was well read in ancient in this ancient wisdom system, I believe. And he it, absolutely. Not, and so, two two things on that, and then I'm going to try and make it quick too. But one is a total propaganda agent. Totally agree with you. And the point that you made, I think, is so significant, is to say. We can't put these things on parallel and say that they're, they're all equal. And again, that's it gets back to this point about how his, history is so corrupt. And then you jumped in there and made the important point that maybe intentionally so. But to think that Josephus, once he's been discredited as fully as he has, clearly just a propaganda agent, and then they go back to him time and time again to, to use him. Logically, there must be something else uh, going that's on right. here and, that's right and because actually, he's part of a conspiracy that's still going on is mm -hmm. what i would say that i would say he's part of a conspiracy that's still going on and here's some evidence for that let me go back to sharon because we're you, you know you said you wanted to do a finish finish up and let me sh let me share with some evidence that shows that this conspiracy is still going on everybody probably knows where this is this is qumran wadi qumran this is the famous cave four where the vast majority of the Dead Sea Scrolls are found. The Dead Sea Scrolls mm -hmm. found in the 1940s, the uh, you know fragments of over 900 texts, manuscripts, and in thousands of pieces like jigsaw puzzles discovered in the 40s and then given into the hands of an international group of scholars who were almost entirely, as you may know, uh, high up, in the Roman Catholic priesthood, okay? Roland DeVoe was the, the head of this International Dead Sea Scrolls Committee and then his lieutenant was J.T. Millick. And um, they kept the Dead Sea Scrolls basically under wraps for their entire lives. They didn't let anyone see anything but the manuscripts that were translations of biblical Old Testament text. This was these are all um, Old Testament. This is a this is part of Judaism, or not even we shouldn't say Judaism because that's a later development. This is part of um, Jewish different esoteric communities and studies that were going that were all over uh, the place. Not just in Judea, there were lots of Jewish scholars in Egypt. There were lots of Jewish scholars in what we but, call but Mesopotamia. Hold, hold on, hold on, because I have to put an exclamation yeah. point on something you just said, because it's so freaking significant. And I think the, the you know, we have a problem in talking for a long time, because there's so much to, to process. <laughs> I'm here. trying to go fast. I'm not. No, you're doing you're doing so right. great. You're doing so great. I mean, uh, the only point I was just going to make is that last point you made is so freaking significant because to me you say it slight in slightly different language like it's still going on today and i think that kind of freaks people out how could that be but it's still going on today because if you talk to the average person they go oh yeah the dead sea scrolls oh yeah they kind of uh, uh in they some support, ways they support christianity <laughs> that's right they kind of support christianity but it also kind of introduces some you know, possible contradictions and stuff like that. But what they did, which is to me another play in the playbook, is they did the four corner stall in basketball, right? 
So they, they completely the, the, they do come completely. out. The, the, and, and to yeah. understand the subtlety of it to me is to begin to understand the mechanism of control. Again, if we ever get back to it, I mean, that's what they figured out way back. The Romans figured that out really early is, you know, just control all the little stupid bureaucracies, control the DMV and the water department, just get your tentacles and all that stuff and you'll, you'll have a lot of benefit. So the, the, the way they do it here is they get the Dead Sea Scrolls and they go, amazing discovery, amazing discovery. And they do a four corner stall for 50 years. And by the time it eventually comes out and people are going, wait a minute, this says something completely different because it does come out eventually. And then, so for anyone who complains and says, well, it uh, says, you know, well, they did this. Well, then they point to and go, wait a minute, we released it all. And it's, it's so subtle. It's so subtle, I guess is my point. Yeah, it is really, it is the story. So you can, there's a, actually a great podcast by someone named Gary Stevens called History in the Bible. And he goes through this whole scandal of the Dead Sea Scrolls in episode 18 of his podcast. And you can listen to that and you can, it wasn't just this committee, they had help. <laughs> and so the, they released the parts that were already, you know, books of the Bible that we've seen. That was like 20%. And they kept everything else under wraps. And it was, it was because of some micro, film kind of photographs of them that they finally came out and the work of people like um oh i'm forgetting his, i'm blanking on his name but it's a big long drama soap opera finally in the 80s and 90s all these pieces finally are coming out and they show something very different than the kind of story that this group that wanted to keep them under wraps wanted to say that they were but they did release let me show here's a, a, some pieces of one of the scrolls um most of the scrolls are on leather or on vellum, which is made from leather, or some on papyrus. But there's one scroll known as the copper, the copper scroll, and you see it on the right hand side of your screen. It looks very different than the the written scroll. The copper scroll, it was <laughs> it was all rolled up on copper and was so old that they had to cut it in part, and so that's why these pieces now look kind of like like a half of a tube. What is the copper scroll? It's basically a list of treasure. It's a list of treasure. It, this is how it reads. This is the first words of the Copper Scroll, not the part that I'm showing, by the way, that's like piece number 18. But on piece one, it says, in the ruin that's in the Valley of Acor, under the steps with the entrance at the east. So you go to the ruins, find the entrance that's on the east, then under the steps, a distance of 40 cubits, a strong box of silver and its vessels with a weight of 17 talents, which by the way, a talent at that time, New Testament talent or that period talent, 129 pounds. So that's 129 pounds of silver times 17. That's a lot. That's just one. This thing just goes over and over. Here's where you find this treasure and here's what's there. Here's where you find, and it is, it is tons of silver, gold, jewels, etc. Well, on that, on that, um, panel of experts. There was one, <laughs> there was one uh, maverick named John Allegro. Most people have heard of John Allegro. You, you've probably heard of John Allegro. He wrote the Sacred Mushroom in the Cross uh, in in the early seventies. That oh, it's all about um, mushrooms. You know, psychedelic mushrooms. He was actually pushing for the publication of the scrolls. He was he was the one maverick who was pushing. He actually said, "This is a treasure map. I'm going to go search for it." He never found any of the treasure. Why not? Well, so how is this like, how does Wikipedia tell you, what does Wikipedia tell you about the copper scrolls? Or what, what did those, the, 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 what did um, JT Millick tell you the copper scroll was? Oh, it's just a child's exercise book for learning writing. Oh, is that what they really a, say? A, that's one of the things that they said. I mean, oh. Oh, it, you know, the Essenes could have never had any of this treasure. Of course, they were this ascetic community, which, you know, they were an ascetic community. Who says all these scrolls belong to the Essenes? You see, the, this was probably the trove, the library of the temple so that the Romans don't burn it down and the treasure of the temple so that the Romans don't get it. And someone knew, oh, by the way, at the end of the Copper Scroll, it says, this is a copy. This is a copy. You know, we put it on this. <laughs> they don't say it, but why would you put it on copper? So it can't burn. So look, 
this treasure is important. We don't want to lose it. We're going to put we're going to put the treasure map or the treasure instructions. It's not really a map on something that can't be destroyed. Copper and um, this will be the backup copy. Well, who had the who had the other copy? I bet you Josephus knew how to find it, and that's why Vespasian and Titus got all the loot and were managed to become emperors. And that's the evidence is is pretty overwhelming that. <laughs> I mean, as you said, Josephus didn't get all those things because, you know, he said, I think you're going to become the emperor. OK, thanks a lot. Cut off his head. He said, I know where the treasure is buried. Please don't cut off my head because you won't get any of it. The other thing you're adding to the story that's really significant is there's this incredible chaos in Rome and who yeah. will become oh, yeah. emperor is really up for grabs. And yeah. what you're adding to the story is. One guy comes forward and goes, you know, I think I should be emperor, and I got tons and tons of gold and silver that agrees with me. And he does, and he walks in, the Arch of Titus, and he builds the Colosseum, he does all that. Kind of makes for a good story. It makes for a good story. And the, he, money, he doesn't get there by greasing people's palms. He gets there by having an army. He's got the muscle behind him. And good he's point. Able to pay the muscle with that money. Good that, point. That money is used to buy the mercenaries or the because he takes it. He, he kind of takes his time, and again, the way conventional history writes it, it's stupid. It doesn't make any sense why he's kind of in the running or, or elected emperor. But then he takes his time. He goes and gets his stuff together. Well, he goes and gets his army together, and he's like, okay, you know, here's how it's going to work. The the whole thing. I mean, and then so then comes the takeover by the sole invictus mithras acting in conjunction with literalist christianity it's like a pincher movement they're not enemies they're two sides of the same operation and, well, well and, we, and, we got to tell people as quickly as we can and we did i think yeah. we're doing as good as we can in the time but this sole invictus because yeah. it's a classic secret society, just a classic secret society. And you've already tied it to the murders that it commits, but it's just, it's evil. It's like an evil secret society that we would, you know, uh, understand in, in modern times. Well, you know, that's interesting. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about evil and I, um, I would say it is a hierarchical and so, so here's why it's not a religion. It's usually posited as a rival to Christianity. The, their Mithraea are scattered all over Europe in significant places, a lot around Rome, or a lot in Ostia, Antiqua, which you can visit today. And explain what a Mithraea is. Yeah, so it's a small meeting clubhouse, basically. And it always has this scene. When you enter, that's on the far wall. And then it's got benches arranged in a U and I diagram them in the book and lots of, you can read about this. Lots of scholars have talked about it, but once again, the history of scholarship of Mithraism is again, rife with obscuration, obfuscation, um, wrong leads. There was someone who said in the 1860s, the right answer, and he was ignored. <laughs> and then finally in the early seventies, some scholars came up with uh, the right answer, but I wouldn't say it's evil. What I would say, it, well, okay, the, the goals of the operation were to take over the, the Roman Empire and to impose feudalism and impose literalist Christianity and, and all kinds of evil things were done. But the, the, let's say the low ranking members, you could be a member of one of these lodges and they could only seat like 10 to 15 to 20 people, the, the size of these. It's basically like a dining room kind of a setup. OK, and only like 15 to 20 men. It was exclusively for men. It was like a dining club. You'd go in there and it was very hierarchical. It had seven ranks. At the, so you could keep people kind of in the dark in the lower ranks. It was only in the higher ranks where it was a perfect. It's a structure for secrecy and taking over. So if you let someone in, you can observe them at the lower ranks and decide, hey, should we let this guy to the fourth rank where we start giving him some secrets or not? As you point out in the book, there's some people that actually make it to the level of emperor for a brief period of time, and they're only level three. 
That's right. That's right. <laughs> so imagine, That's imagine how how compromised your position is when you know that there's all this that these are the guys who are basically calling all the shots, but you're in the position of emperor, and you're only a level three. You know your right. days are, are numbered, or you know better yet, you know you better march to what they say. Right, and in in history, and, and Flavio Barbiero kind of points this out over and over. That history is full of, and then that emperor was removed, you know, assassinated. <laughs> exactly. and, and he says, "Look, he he tried to cross Sol Invictus because now he thought he thinks, oh, I'm the emperor, I can do what I want. I'm going to start throwing my weight around." And they're like, "Okay, get rid of him," because these Mithraea pop up. The first one is in the is in the vicinity of the Praetorian Guard, which is like the Emperor's bodyguard. And they quickly put... Yeah, let me just interject, you know, since we're throwing out a ton of stuff. V Vespasian was one of the first ones to really clue into how important it was to really keep the Praetorian Guard close, because he had seen in previous destabilizations that you know that would be the easiest way it'd be like the what, what we'd say like the secret service or somebody like that you know as close to the president i mean they, if they wanted to they could take out the president and so he kind of saw right am i right about that well so part of the theory is that um he wouldn't he wouldn't use romans in the praetorian guard he would use people who had a debt to him like did josephus owe vespasian yeah Josephus owed Vespasian his life, right? Those other, look, the, the people who were leading the rebellion were warriors. They were fighters. They were hard rebels. And Vespasian said, Josephus, you can bring over, you know, some of your friends. Some of those friends could be installed in the Praetorian Guard because now they are loyal to Vespasian. Whereas if he brings someone in who grew up in Rome, who knows who that guy's loyal to? He might be working for a different faction, but these get these are my guys. I'm going to put them in charge of the Praetorian Guard. So you're right, but I'm not alleging that Vespasian was actually the first sole Invictus Emperor, according to Barbiero's theory, was Commodus. Was Commodus? They, and Marcus Aurelius, his father, was trying to figure out what was going on. Who is trying to take over the empire? And Marcus Aurelius was persecuting not sole Invictus, but the Christians. So it was like a two-pronged approach. Sol Invictus was this underground, they met in these underground, or they were made to look like they were underground, secret meeting places where it was very small in number. It was not a big congregation of 50 or 100 or 500 people. It was very small. And it was, that's the planning, that's the secret part. And the heat shield that draws the anger when the emperors are trying to figure out who is taking over the empire, they persecute the Christians. They're like, these Christians are trying to stir things up, but they never got to the nerve center, which was this underground society of soul invictus. Okay, I tell you what, as we try and wrap this up, yeah. you gotta tell this, this is a, no, it's all the great stuff. I, I so appreciate you spending all this time. And like I said, we'll, we'll have to find a way to do it again, maybe in a more, more organized, focused way, or maybe not, I don't know, maybe this is good. But the whole story of the the Mithra that lasts sixty years after yeah, yeah, Constantine Mithra, yeah. builds his church. If this isn't the clincher, it's a good way to end it because it's like yeah. if you have any doubt about how fake this you know establishment of uh, Christianity, literalist Christian Christianity, is by Constantine in the Roman Empire. This seals it. He he's just seals it. So, yeah, so let me show you. So I just argued that there are two sides of the same coin. That's actually Barbiero's phrase. Flavio Barbiero wrote an, uh, wrote an essay called Mithras and Christianity or Mithraism and Christianity, two sides of the same coin. They are operating together. And yet history continues to tell you. You can still find history books, recent ones, talking about Mithraism. Oh, it was the rival to Christianity. It almost took over the empire. You know, if, if only more people had joined in with Mithraism, we'd all be Mithras today instead of Christians. No, it was a, it was a, it was the underground arm. Um, it was a secret a society. It was a secret society. And the reason it had blood curdling oaths of secrecy, if you betray what's going on inside of this 
meeting, you will be killed. Why? Because their lives were on the line. If they got caught with what they were trying to pull off, the Romans would have completely had no mercy for them. So this was a, it was structured in a way to keep it secret, to prevent infiltration. And it apparently was very effective. And it is, so we'll, we'll end on that point that you make. These are two sides of the same operation, but let's just look really quickly. I think I have, why, yes, there it is, a constellation. This is, so for a hundred years, there's the scholarship of Mithraism has said, oh, this came, you know, this is based on, uh, there's this scholar named Kumant, and I go into all the um, the history, but in the 70s, a bunch of scholars said, this, this whole thing that we're being told about the origins of Mithraism are wrong. It looks like it's based on the stars. And David Ulancey wrote a really good book that argues that Mithra slaying the bull is based on the outlines of the constellation Perseus, which you can see right here. This is Perseus. I'm showing this as a segue into two sides of the same coin, because remember, we're not told that Christianity is based on the stars. Mithraism can be shown to be based on the stars. So can Christian or so can the stories in the Bible. Let me just say stories in the Bible. I'm separating that from what we think of as literalist Christianity. So Mithraism is consciously using this ancient system while it destroys the rest of the ancient system for everybody else. It destroys the ancient wisdom of the gods and goddesses that were given to the Romans, given to the Greeks, given to the Egyptians, and imposes literalist Christianity. And yet it's using this ancient system. Here's why Mithras is um, killing the bull. There's Perseus, there's Taurus. I could show you all the connections between these two. The, David U. Lancey wrote a book in 1989 showing these connections, and he's absolutely right. And this is all, there's the Zodiac right there. This is all the ancient system. So now I'll stop sharing and just tell that story to finish off. The, the, the underground cult or secret society of Mithras, the public facing inclusive, you know, hey, we let everybody in, literalist Christianity, we're operating together. They're both using, this ancient wisdom is based on the stars, but literalist Christianity won't admit that. They won't say, oh yeah, all our stories are based on the stars. They're telling you, you have to believe in it as if it's literal. So the, the, the seven ranks of Mithraism, they, they go, um, I think it's Raven, uh, Raven, nymph, soldier, lion, um, sun runner, Persian. I may have that backwards. Persian, sun runner, and then father, pater in Latin. Pater is the top of the, the top of the pyramid. So each lodge has a pater. The head of each lodge is the pater, and then there's people who are at the lowest level. You know, they're they're just a raven, or then they become a nymph, which means a bridegroom basically, and then they become a soldier. And they probably don't get past that level unless they're really trustworthy. Then they become a lion, a Leo, a Persian, a sun runner. Only the, you know, only the super trustworthy, because this is a secret society that's trying to take over the Roman Empire. The pater is the head of that lodge, but all the lodges are headed by a Mithraeum that's in a place called the Phrygianum, and it's in Rome. And the head of that lodge is called the pater patrum the father of fathers. He's not just the father of a lodge. He's also the father of all the fathers of the other lodges. He's the father of fathers. And the Phrygianum is located beneath St. Peter's Basilica. To this day, St. Peter, you know, where the Bishop of Rome has his headquarters is built right on top of where the Phrygianum, the head, the, the head lodge of Mithraism and as you've alluded to the last but hold on because we were told yeah. we've been told all along that that's a kind of representation of how christianity defeated oh, yeah, and just kind of rubbed it in their right. face that we're on top right. of mithraism right yeah they were enemies but um when you look at the dates of the the, <laughs> the death of the last father of fathers of mithraism before they finally said okay let's shut down mithraism we've got the empire it's done its we purpose 
it's done its purpose. Let's put let's put it on ice. We we'll, we can we can bring that Terminator back out whenever we need it. Right. Like, put it in the freezer and we'll bring it out again later to weaponize it if necessary. But the last pater patrum of Mithraism was <laughs> was operating in the Phrygianum after the first historical pope for 60 years, not <laughs> 62 years at the same time. And then finally, they shut down Mithraism. And so their, co their headquarters were in the same basic building for 62 years, operating completely peacefully together. And then and Constantine was always in the deal. Constantine from the beginning, he never gave up his well, yeah, what so, do you think so, level what do you think level Constantine was at? Well, so so um, so what happened was, but but just the, the final kind of or there's a few points to show look, the Pope, the name Pope is the Bishop right. of Rome. That is a right. contraction of the words pater patrum. So he basically took over the title of the head of Mithraism. And Flavio Barbiero says he actually uses the same chair as the head of the of Mithra and that has Mithraic things carved on it. And the, you know, the hat that a pope wears or the headgear of a pope is called a what? A bishop's, do you know? Mitre, M-I-T-R-E, a bishop's mitre, which is basically linguistically related to the word Mithraism. So it, mm. the, the symbols of Mithraism survive in literalist Christianity because they were two sides of the same operation it is not um so just really quickly the the this is look my my research is about the connection of the myths and the stars you asked about you know where does constantine fit into all this let me just show this uh so there's the year of four emperors that kind of chaos that vespasian and his line was able to capitalize on and become the emperor is way up there in 68 69 and then vespasian becomes emperor in 69 the the, this operation is carefully working behind the scenes. We see kind of the first Mithraea start to pop up towards the end of the first century, i.e. in the 80s and 90s, in the time of Domitian, right around the Praetorian Guard, as we mentioned. And it is working in the background and building and, and building its stepping stones. And Marcus Aurelius, I put him in capital letters because I think that's an important turning point because he seems to have realized something was going on. He's called one of the last, um, Edward Gibbons, you know, in his big 1700s book, Decline and Fall of Roman Empire, calls Marcus Aurelius the last of the five good emperors, Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian, Antoninus, and Marcus Aurelius. You can see Marcus Aurelius and Varus were at the same time, but Aurelius out, outlived him. Um, he was considered a very good emperor. He was a philosopher. We know he's a Stoic. He wrote, you know, his meditations that you can still read today. They're excellent to read. His son, Commodus, Barbiero argues, was the first time Sol Invictus was able to maneuver a Sol Invictus emperor into the role of emperor. And they put, to keep an eye on him, his wife or his concubine, Marcia, was a Christian. So, um, and she may have conspired, you know, Commodus was, was, was murdered by the head of the Praetorian Guard uh, in conjunction, I think, with Marcia when he got too crazy. I mean, he was crazy. He was, he, was, uh, he was a megalomaniac, just like Joaquin Phoenix shows in that movie. Um, so this battle is going on. The Senate is not happy with Roman Empire being taken over. So there's a battle between they don't want the old gods to be shut down. They don't want their gig to be folded up and closed down. And so there's a pull, pull and a push. The first actual literalist Christian who says, I'm a Christian, was down there, Philip I, uh, down in 244, 249 there. And he called Philip the Arab because he was born in what's today Syria. Um, he was a general. Gallienus was also, uh, or Gallienus was also a... Uh, uh, may have may have had some Christian leanings, but then you had this thing come in called the Tetrarchy. So these emperors are getting, you can see they're getting eliminated often very quickly after they get put into power, if they mess up or if if the, the secret society decides that we need to move him out. The Tetrarchy was this system that was set up by four emperors that said, look, 
let's let's the four of us basically become two presidents and two co two vice presidents or two emperors and two because the, they saw the gig they saw what was yeah. going on and they said maybe <laughs> that way we they can't can assassinate me <laughs> yeah yeah exactly i mean which is super super important i mean the, the whole reason they right. did it was it would be like i mean does this again folks does this play to modern times it's like how do we how do we it seems impossible to stop this machine that we're in the big uh, in the middle of if you believe the kind of I mean, the New World Order stuff is so in your face right now. I don't know how anyone can deny it. But if you were if you believed that and you were going to try and derail it, how would you derail it? It seems even possible to set up. Well, that's what these guys said. Like, look, it's impossible to derail it. Maybe we can split it up. Maybe we can, they had some kind of right. I mean, is that kind of a parallel? Yeah, they, they, basically, it's a terrible governing structure. You wouldn't. Right. Like, right. <laughs> you wouldn't do it for efficiency. You don't say, well, the best way to run the country is to have four presidents and they can all argue with each other. No, you do it for this way. If I'm president, I know they can't take me out because I still got three of my buddies, you know, and or even if they're not my buddies, I still got some right. kind of play right. in the thing. So yeah. it, actually, you know, I, you may have heard of May Brussel. Uh, May Brussel actually recommended the president after the president gets elected should only afterwards get to pick the vice president that yeah, way yeah yeah <laughs> because basically what you have happening is here's the guy who's behind you know you mess up we got uh we got the vice president right behind that's the one who's really most of the time pulling the strings right i mean you mentioned reagan i'm not sure he was actually pulling the strings on iran contra but we'll set that aside so the sol invictus said uh, the secret society said you know, this tetrarchy is a problem. And by the way, one of the tetrarchs started persecuting Christians very ferociously because they knew that this is a tug of war. This is a major battle. The game is raging. It's like Game of Thrones. And they're like, someone is trying to take over. And I think it's those Christians. And the, one of the tetrarchs was just massacring Christians right and left. And, and we uh, should interject that this is often used by Christians as a way to kind of smokescreen this whole thing, whether they're doing it knowingly or not, it's like, well, how, of course it was a battle. Look at how they're look at how they're going after the Christians. Right. And as you point out, at one way, and then I'd add to the other thing is, it doesn't mean that everybody. There's all these different levels, right? So th these people that are in the highest position, they might not be in. <laughs> to the to clued in to the actual you know they might not get the newsletter that hey we, our plan really is to use these christians you know uh, that's in play too right absolutely i don't think that uh not everybody knows most, exactly what's going on so, no look the <laughs> i think i think most people as i did sign up for the army um out of good intentions and they and the whole time i was in the army i never i, I would never uh, glimpsed a single conspiratorial thing, you know, in the 11 years of active duty and four years at, at West Point. There's people who are in the uh, Christian church who are absolutely sincere and um, and well-meaning, I, I believe. But, um, you know, there's certain people at the top and it doesn't take that many as as the Sol Invictus system shows. shows. Yeah, they, they knew what they were doing and they did it. I think they did it pretty effectively and systematically. And, um, and they had a, a way of passing it down because this took generations, as you can see here. But so after the Tetrarchy, they said, we've got a Constantine came in. They said, look, we're going to put in an emperor and he's going to declare himself to be openly Christian and he's going to make Christianity official. Not that it was Theodosius who said you can only be Christian. Constantine said Christianity is now the official religion and everyone, you know, can do it without being persecuted. And um, that's when Sol Invictus finally starts to shut down and fade out of the picture because they decided, well, if we've got the emperor and we've, now we've got literalist Christianity in the driver's seat, then we don't need to operate in the secret part anymore. We'll just operate through the public part, the, the literalist Christian mechanisms. And so you mentioned, you know, how do Christians kind of spin this? Like, how is it that Christianity, which was never a very large percentage of the empire, Constantine decides, I'm a Christian and let's make Christianity. Did he have a, a legitimate 
conversion and this is the hand of God? Or was it a, some people say, oh, it was a cynical move. He was doing it for power and uh, control, you know, to, to, to cement control over the emperor, the empire. And Flavio Barbiero says that's ridiculous. No more than at the most 20% of the population was Christian in the empire at Constantine's time. There's no, it wouldn't make any sense for him to do that for political purposes. It didn't gain him anything. It was, a, it was this, this long, careful operation said, okay, here's how we're going to, here's how, the Tetrarchy really screwed things up. Here's what we need to do. We need to come out of the shadows and, and make Christianity the advisor to the emperor. And by the way, let's move the emperor right on out of Rome, which they had already moved the emperor out of Rome earlier within Italy to Ravenna or Ravenna. But where did Constantine move the, <laughs> the head of, where does the emperor go? Constantinople. Where does the church stay? Rome, right? So now we don't have pesky emperors marching. You know, we don't have Game of mm -hmm. Thrones happening in mm -hmm. Rome anymore. It's like the church can, <laughs> the church takes Rome and says, Emperor, you go off over there <laughs> into Turkey and any Game of Thrones activity will happen over there. Thank you very much. And Theodosius basically after him, the emperor split in half and, and they shut down the empire, as you said, it's much more, uh, it, what happened after that, it, it's, it's much easier to govern through the, through the organ of the church and the, uh, that, that had control over all these fiefdoms, all these separate kings. Um, they well, you, just like you're saying, you combine the church with the empire, with the army, you got it, you know, you go into whatever barbarian quote unquote tribe and you say okay you're all christian now right so we all get along so listen to me and if you step out of line i still got the army that's right and and um you know and during the middle ages the kings and the nobles and the aristocrats were you know basically they they were eating all the fat of the land and the people were on a subsistence kind of and there were, look, yeah, the, the, the nobles had more weapons, but still they didn't have, they didn't have more people that, that mind control part of, well, the, the noble is over you because of God's will. And yeah, you may be able to mass enough people to have a rebellion and, and kill him, but then you will burn in hell forever. And here's some of the torments that will happen to you. Do you really want to risk that? Oh yeah, you're right risky to try and overthrow him and certainty of eternal punishment. Okay. You know, it, it, it's, um, it's, it was an essential part of the oppression that was feudalism. And we're, and we're still fighting that battle today. I would, I would argue. So anyway, we, how many hours did we just do? Alex? We did <laughs> two, two hours and 45 minutes, but it, it was great. I love the way you, uh, I love the way you wrapped it up. I think that really kind of brought it into focus. So, uh, David, as we do wrap it up, tell folks more about, hey, and, and let's go here because I haven't gone there yet. Your website, Star Myths of the World, and that is uh, starmythworld.com. And yeah. tell folks what they're going to find there in particular beyond the Amazon books that we've already shown them. Sure. Well, yeah, as, as you may have seen at the top, there's a books section where you can see inside the books. Uh, you can see that on Amazon as well. But there's also a videos section. I've made, you know, many dozen videos. Not all of them are up on the website. There's a podcast archive. I've been on a lot of podcasts. Um, and I'll put, you know, this video in there too in the podcast archive um, when we're ready. And there's a blog that's a long running blog that's fully searchable. So you can go to the blog and then you can search for Mithras if you want to see anything I've written about that, or you can search for different gods or goddesses or different constellations if you're interested. So, um, you know, I mean, all that, uh, <laughs> my real focus is on the connection between the stars and the myths, all this history stuff that's, you know, that's things you can also learn from other researchers, but I, obviously it has a connection. Something has been lost. 
I think that that story that I just sketched out is a very valid explanation of how this wisdom was lost. I think it was lost twice, as I, as I mentioned, but I think that the suppression of this wisdom is still going on deliberately. Um, but I don't know why you wouldn't want to know what the Bible is really saying. I mean, no matter how much you love the Bible, um, I would think that the people who make it their full life would want to know the because the language of the stars that is in the Bible unlocks the message, unlocks more profound aspects of the message. So anyway, that's what I try and talk about in my books and my writings and videos. <laughs> well put, I really do think you brought it brought it together in a new way. I keep getting stuff. It is uh, fantastic for you to come and spend all this time and your research, everything I said at the beginning, I double down on all of it. You know, who else has kind of been able to pull so many pieces together? And it's just awesome talking to you. Dave Matheson, <laughs> thanks again. Thanks so much, Alex. And I'm still learning. <laughs> I still have lots more to learn. <laughs> Thanks again to David Matheson for joining me today on Skeptico. One question I'd have to tee up from this interview, kind of a litmus test question. Do you think the mafia, the Sicilian mafia, the descendants, the Romans, did they have anything to do with the assassination of JFK? What's your opinion? The history is almost 60 years old, so it's okay to talk about it, right? Love to hear from you. Let me know on the Skeptico forum or any way you reach me. Plenty of stuff coming up. Stay with me for all of that. Until next time, take care and bye for now. Mm -hmm.